Mr. Barr just got up and started threatening to do something. So, M Madam Mayor, you can hear us. <laughs> yes. OK, so there you go. Ms. Kukesh, go ahead. Shall I start from the top? Oh, okay. they're, they're good. <laughs> Let me go back to my introduction, my clean gut introduction. Um, so I am here to talk to you today about the um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which um, passed Congress last year, I believe, and then this last session, legislative session, the passage of House Bill 363, which created the Alaska Broadband Office in the Department of Commerce. And in that office, we have been tasked with providing internet for all. And that means the entire state of Alaska and in communities that are unserved, underserved, and served, and as, as well as anchor institutions. Um, is, is that the way it's going to look? Okay. <laughs> so, hold on one second. So the broadband and digital equity um, is a partnership between the state of Alaska and the Rasmussen Foundation, and we have several other partners. We have the Alaska Municipal League, um, Alaska Federation of Natives, and we're also um, seeking others to be a part, be in partnership with us on this digital equity um, act, basically that we are ta tasked with for the state of Alaska to provide internet for all, as well as the ability to be able to get online and access the um, the digital platform, if you will. Um, next slide. And so the state broadband office was, as I said, um, stood up in September of 2022 through the House Bill 363, which created um, the the Alaska Broadband Office. And currently we have four staff members. We have the director, Thomas Lochner, who came to us from Aztec, and he is responsible for basically providing the map and the draft plan that would connect Alaska um, to the fiber optic cables that um, connect us to the rest of the world, as well as Lisa Von Bargen, who is our senior project manager. We also have Anessa Firo, who is um, an admin specialist, and she has been instrumental in getting all of our um, items in, you know, is on the website, um, all of our listening sessions that we're going to be doing online. I mean, you name it, she's been doing it. And I was hired as a tribal liaison to work with our tribal communities, our native communities to ensure that their plans or their approaches to um, closing the digital divide is incorporated into the, the overall picture, sorry. Um, next slide. So why a broadband or why a Rasmussen broadband initiative? Rasmussen Foundation, prior to the passage of IJA and the House Bill 363, they had been investing in um, Alaska in the broadband initiative. And I believe they had well over $3 million invested before the money um, started coming to, to the state through the um, through IJA and House Bill 363. Next slide. So the broadband initiative goals are to provide all Alaskans with access to high speed, reliable broadband at an affordable price through an equitable and transparent process that engages communities and results in a strong governance structure that ensures programmatic goals and benefits that are realized. Next slide. This slide always makes me smile because I always think about what this used to be. Um, <laughs> the digital equity, um, it's the condition in which individuals and communities have the form information technology capacity that is needed for full participation in the society and economy of the United States. We had a gentleman from Uktiavik tell us the other day that he just wanted his, his children to be on the same level of playing field as the rest of the world. And so that's what we're shooting for here um, with the digital equity, digital inclusion, digital um, literacy. Next slide. So the, dig the Digital Equity Act um, provides digital skills training and education to low-income groups, improves online accessibility of social services for individuals with disabilities, and empowers rural communities to measure and address their own broadband needs. Next slide. 
I don't know who I'm talking to when I'm asking for. Oh. <laughs> okay. The planning will lead to implementation. Each state will identify barriers to digital equity in the state and strategies for overcoming those barriers. NTIA, the National Tele Telecommunications Information Association, I believe, or it could be, will distribute digital equity capacity grants through states and national competitive grants. And these will be available in federal funds for the Alaska Broadband. And I, from my understanding, all of this will be funneled through the state of Alaska into three different pots. And I believe we have a state planning grant, a state capacity grant, and a competitive grant process. Next slide. And so the covered populations include um, many um, that we are familiar with, um, the low income individuals at or below 150% of the poverty level, individuals um, age 60 and older, so our elders, incarcerated individuals, others um, other than those incarcerated in a federal um, facility, our veterans, individuals with disabilities, individuals with a language barrier, members of a racial or ethnic minority group, and of course, my favorite, rural Alaskans. Alaska's digital equity plan will include a statewide vision for the digital equity, the digital equity framework and scorecard, plans for digital literacy innovation programs, proposed technology related apprenticeships and other workforce opportunities, integration with the state's upcoming economic development strategy, educational and health outcomes, and civic and social engagement, action steps to implement the digital equity plan. Next slide. The digital equity will include the state digital equity plan, plus the tribal digital equity plan, which is the part that I'm more um, comfortable, I think, speaking to. <laughs> and the state broadband planning and all of this will be put in one in one plan basically which is the state's five-year broadband action plan next slide the planning process um, is to listen and understand the out, outreach to covered populations data collection and analysis and other planning efforts and and it's all dependent upon your community that you're in, the covered populations and what best suits them and, not, and making it tailored specifically for them instead of uh, saying, this is how it has to be done. This is what you need to do. It's, it's geared towards um, what would work and help with them. And consideration um, as well as strategies that respond to identified needs and gaps and consult with a diverse di digital equity working group. The, the reflection is a draft draft Alaska's digital equity plan and, <laughs> and receive public comment from Alaskans as well as prepare for implementation efforts. Next slide. The statewide communications includes listening sessions with key populations, which is part of the reason we are here today, public representation, public comment processes, social media, email, and other media to raise awareness, and local advertisement and public service announcements, and to partner with community anchor institutions to help distribute information and host listening sessions. And so the listening sessions, next slide. We've had approximately 48 public meetings <clears throat> to date, and they have they were started in October when I, I think I started in mid-October, so they were already well underway um, through April 2023. And the majority of the listening sessions will take place, well, they have taken place in the fall and through the spring of 2023. Um, and this is where we are definitely trying to um, reach out to communities to help us in finding areas where we can um, go to places where basically like for gold medal, for example, like there'll be a ton of communities there. That would be a great opportunity, you know, to engage in the populations and the engagement tour on the next slide, if you see. Um, we've covered many of the hub communities, but part of my job, I think, as a tribal liaison is to hit the remote and rural communities. But if there are any events or any um, 
any basically any events in the future that we could um, have an opportunity to present that would be great and and get the feedback on what works and what doesn't work in these covered populations. The next slide. So a required element of the plan will be an asset inventory. This means taking stock of what initiatives are already working to increase digital equity, such as digital navigators, digital literacy programs, affordable programs, equipment programs, and developing digital content that meets the needs of the covered populations. So we can give them a computer, but for them to know how to use the computer, how to turn on the computer, how to plug it into the internet, how to connect it, how to safely connect it. So that way, you know, like when you think about our elders, we definitely don't want them to be um, put in any sort of jeopardy with fraud. Um, how communities can help. <clears throat> Are there convenings that we can get digital equity input? Are there covered populations in your community or region? that may be especially difficult to reach and how can we hear from them because it's really important that we do hear from the eight covered populations and do we have any initiatives to address digital equity have you done or are you doing any digital equity planning and how can we find out and i believe that is exactly why i'm here to find out ways that we could definitely partner um, the next slide is the last slide and it has the Rasmussen contact information as well as um, our state contact information. Um, the state of Alaska also has information on the Commerce website, and we will be having we will be hosting listening sessions starting um, on Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday is the general listening sessions, and it's during the day. And then the the second session on Thursday is a technical. Um, a technical listening session for all of those who are interested in the map itself and how we could potentially connect all of Alaska to um, the internet, to Wi-Fi, to broadband, however you'd like to refer to it, um, as well as the capital cost model and how we would connect to a certain community, like, for example, how we would get to Gus Davis or how we would um, go from Heidelberg to Craig or Klawak, you know, it just depends on the the community and how how we would how we would reach those community those communities basically. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Who has questions or comments for Ms. Kushesh? Uh, Ms. Wong. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thanks for being here. Um, was curious about well i'm i'm really happy that you are doing um this outreach i immediately thought of our libraries as a place where a lot of people go to um access technology and internet resources that they don't otherwise have access to in their home so i'm curious um have you been doing outreach to the libraries, or if not, that might be my comment as um, we can probably put you in touch with staff here who can um, provide outreach opportunities to the libraries. I, I feel like some of my lifelines on the um, assembly could definitely help me answer that question, but I know that I believe a library is considered an anchor institution, and that's definitely one of the um, the like in the remote and rural communities they're you know we're doing an asset inventory of those um those buildings and um and anchor institutions rather and it making sure that there's internet and um the the requirements of the nofo require 100 over 20 and that's considered a served community and in many cases a lot of these communities don't even get 25 over three and um the goal of or the the bottom line of the NOFO is that it has to be 100 over 20 and it has to have the ability to be one gigabyte over one gigabyte. And so it's it. So there's opportunity for it to grow and ensure that, you know, several, I, I think when I was down in Washington state, there were several um, commercials on, on the radio talking about um, basically having four, four people in your home, but all of them being able to take a class, being able to um, FaceTime with one of their family members or, you know, watching videos or watching movies, um, watching YouTube. I mean, the ability for everyone in the home to be on some sort of device 
and access the internet without having any lag time. Ms. Kukash, could you tell us what 100 over 20 refers to? I'm not sure what that, you, you referred to that as a thing, and I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, now that is that a speed that of it, something? It is the speed. Okay. Okay. It's the download and upload. Got it. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't know what that was either. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm just jotting some notes. I'm the liaison to the Juno Commission on Aging, and they're very keen. We, Juno has just recently received a designation of an all-ages friendly community, and so uh, the Juno Commission on Aging and AARP are working on that. And, um, and I know that uh, making sure that older people, our elders, have access is really important, as well as I'm also aware that um, elders who have a low income income can get a federal uh, federal rebate so they don't actually have to pay for their internet. So I'm sure you're all over that, but I'm going to give your contact information to the commission um, because I think that there might be some real common interest and maybe they can give you some information and perhaps participate in the, the listening session. I did have, um, I did have one question um, that follows that, but thank you so much for being here, Ms. Kukesh. Thank you. Um, do, would you like me to answer that first part? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. So I believe you were referring to the Affordable Connectivity Program. Yes. And um, yes, and I actually, um, over winter break, um, took the time with AML to apply for a grant um, in hopes that we can get everyone in Alaska connected to the Affordable Connectivity Program. And it's it's definitely a great program in Alaska. It um, subsidizes $75 of your internet, um, your connection to your home or any device that you choose. And I had my mother do it just to see how it worked. And, and she, so she applied and it, it does take quite a while. It doesn't happen quickly um, in this world of instant gratification. Um, so you definitely have to be patient, but she was able to get the $75 towards her home internet and then she found out that she was eligible for the Lifeline program, which is a dollar a month, I believe. And But she is an elder. And then one of the things that was, I think, even greater was that when my son was helping her set up her phone, because um, we gave her an iPhone, and he told her basically that we had they had to create a complicated um, username and password so she couldn't easily get hacked or um, any fraudulent activity to happen on her account and she was like well grandson said I had to do that and so it definitely is something that um, we've been thinking about and I know we do have partners with AARP who are helping in this digital equity um, listening sessions throughout the state. Well that's really. Hey, Do you have another question? Or I did, did have you... another question, and, and I also helped my mom, and it is complicated, but it worked. Um, my question was, um, and it maybe relates to this idea that AML has of of, uh, of everybody uh, being able to take advantage of the the um, that that connectivity grant program. Um, I'm sure you guys are all over this, but I, I just know from some sort of family connections that there's. You know, it's a competitive environment in Alaska. Uh, put, some companies do it here, and other companies do it there. And and um, I'm sure you're working within that competitive environment framework. And that's part of the reason I think that we have the problems with broadband that we do have in Alaska. Can you speak to that at all, Ms. Kukesh? Um, and so, are you referring to the connections, or are you referring to which part of the challenge? I'm referring to GCI being in certain parts of the state and other companies being in other parts of the states. And in some parts of the states, there's great broadband. And then in other parts of the states, there's not. The state, there's not. And part of that, as I understand it, is because different companies handle the broadband in different parts of the state. Um, and I think that's led to some inequities, as I understand it. Yes, and I think the challenge in the state of Alaska, which I feel like any piece of legislation that comes out of Washington, D.C., is the ex except in Alaska clause, where things are completely different in Alaska as opposed to the rest of the world. And, and the other challenge that if I had my um, my state 
um, broadband presentation, which um, um, shows the connection, shows the fiber optic cables that are connecting Alaska to the rest of the world and where they connect in the state of Alaska. Most of it goes along the the road system and the pipeline. And then we have, I believe we have 112 communities that are served, that are considered served in Alaska. We have 80 communities that have projects that are coming in, whether it's through um, reconnect um, tribal broadband connectivity program. And um, is it the other one is connect? Is it There's one other one that I'm spacing at the moment, but in any case, there, so there's 80 projects coming in and they're connecting um, some of the communities through either microwave or fiber optics. And, um, and then of course there's a satellite option, but um, the 80 projects that are coming in, I believe they are either fiber optic or they're microwave. And then they're, they're, that leaves, 196 communities that are still considered unserved or underserved. And those are the communities that um, are in the remote and rural parts of the state. And we are trying to get um, them connected. And the challenge that we have is that in the NOFO, like I said, it has the 100 over 20. And with microwave, it cannot meet that threshold. And it also cannot meet that threshold with satellite. And while it may take years for us to build out the infrastructure needed to connect all of Alaska. Um, some of these other um, programs are great middle mile or end stops, I think is what they call it, um, in connecting the communities right now. So like some of the communities are able to connect through satellite and some are able to connect through microwave, but but the end goal is for them to be able to consistently connect and to be able to connect at any time of the day and also have it be affordable. And the only, the only, um, the best way to do that, I think, is through the fiber optics, because that will provide the connection that is required in the NOFO. But it still doesn't um, exclude the microwave and the satellite that are available now. I think we have one more question from Ms. Treem. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I'm thinking of ways that CBJ can get involved in this effort. Um, and I do have a question for Ms. Kukesh, but first I was thinking in um, Ms. Huskandis and I have both done some of these listening sessions across the state. And one of the things I've heard in a couple of communities is how either the city or in some places, the internet service provider, when it's the only one it helps residents apply for those assistance programs. And I'm just thinking maybe that's something we can help either promote or provide some assistance for folks who need help signing up for it. But at the very least, maybe we could promote it uh, so people are more aware of it. Um, and then my question, Ms. Kukesh, I remember at the AML conference in December, Mr. Lochner had a, a map <laughs> of like... Um, I think this served and underserved. Yes. And he was talking about um like there's a there's a map that somebody has come up with and it says yes you are yes you have service no you don't have service and it's not correct for like I think most places in Alaska and he was talking about some kind of like protest process challenge, challenge something the FCC um, so that one I was I think we had like some brief discussions in the room I was in about can local governments help with that and like maybe do some bulk challenges? So um, can you explain anything about that? Yes. Ms. Kukesh. Um, so I think you're referring to the um, Federal Communications Commission challenge. And um, all of this is also on the Commerce website, but the FCC mapping challenge basically um, was the, the, the mapping challenge that they did to find all of the broadband serviceable locations. And so when you look at um, a community, for example, if you look at it through Google Earth or however you may look at it, you can see that in some places there are homes, you can see in some places there are rocks. And I think with the, the current mapping, 
the current map that's out there, um, because I, I think it comes out every six months. And um, in the last, in June, it had, um, it didn't include 69 of our communities in Alaska on the map. And so then they started doing a mapping challenge and that mapping challenge included working with the Department of Community or the Division of Community and Regional Affairs to ensure that we were cal counting all of the homes that are in each community and ensuring that we were um, making sure that if there were, um, because there some false positives did come up through that process and like some, you know, it looked like a shadow, it looked like it could have been a roof, but it was probably a rock. And, you know, it, it so the, and then it didn't include some of the homes, you know, that were basically just missed in this challenge. And so the more recent map, I think, includes our 69 communities. And I know the state did a, um, a huge bulk challenge, but there are also, um, so there's several things. There's the FCC map that um, the link is on the website, but also the ability to be able to go in and look at your location. And then you can also test the speeds of your the internet that's at your home and whether or not it's giving you the 100 over 20 or if it's, you know, giving you something a little bit less, but you can definitely check it. And, um, and that's part of, I believe, the challenge is to make sure, one, that your home is on there. And two, if, if it says that you have, that you're served, you can go and make sure by doing the, the test to make sure that you are actually receiving the speeds that it says that you are. Because we do know in some of the locations in Juneau, there's um, some areas where there's no service. And you have very little service. I think even our deputy commissioner has spoke to not having some of the um, some service in like the downtown area. But according to you know whoever her pri provider is, that she has service. And so we can definitely challenge that. You can challenge um, if your home is not on there. You can challenge um, the speed in which you. Um, are being provided internet or broadband service or Wi-Fi service, depending on how you want to refer to it. Somebody wanted to check their home or where should they go to do that? Or how does that work? Are you, uh, how? Um, I, I haven't okay. specifically That's done it, but, it, but it's on, it's on our commerce website. Commerce. Okay. I haven't um, tested the speed at my house. I okay. know it's good. <laughs> um, any more questions for Ms. Kukesh? Comments, if you uh, thank you for coming and, and sharing this info. If other people have thoughts about ways to work with on this, um, you we have your info. And and just to um, um, Carol's um, comment about promoting the ACP, I know Clinket Haida is also doing it, and they have their navigators in Southeast, and they um, I, that's one of the flyers I walk around with trying to promote it. Um, but it, it definitely is, they, you know, they can definitely help, especially for our, our Native community. And I definitely am hoping that we get the grant and we can go out and help others because it's definitely, I, I, I feel like I see millions of dollars coming into the state of Alaska if we got everyone signed up who is eligible. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, Madam Mayor, we are you sure? <laughs> waving goodbye. She's not waving. I was, I was just waving goodbye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item two, uh, Mr. Barr, is that you? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. So um, next on your agenda is uh, the Stomach Racism Review Committee Change, change to Charge. Uh, the SRC is in its third year of, um, of, of being a committee at this point. It's uh, a reminder, it's current, currently set to expire uh, in August, unless you change that. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, the uh, committee has been uh, reviewing all legislation that you introduce in your, um, when, you're, when you're sitting as the assembly, uh, then that legislation then goes to SRC uh, and, and then comes back to you with a recommendation. Um, you have a memo in your packet from uh, Assistant Municipal Attorney Gottschalk uh, that summarizes the scope changes that the committee uh, would like to uh, request. They had those discussions in November and then again in February. Um, of course, we can go into detail here. I think the, the nutshell summary of the scope change is to add 
uh, policies, uh, potential policies that they would that they would uh, review and select for their review in addition to legislation. Um, we also have uh, Chair Lee, uh, as well as Member Freilich, and I imagine we might have a few more members online as well um, here that are available to you uh, for uh, questions or discussion. Um, and I think at the end of the day, what we're looking for you tonight is um, discussion, Q&A, and eventual direction on what you would like to see. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Ms. Lee, did you want to come up and um, give a presentation or talk to us about this? Okay. And if you could um, press the button to make it green and identify yourselves for the record. And Madam Chair, before she begins, um, just to make note, we do have um, some of the other members of the SRC committee in Zoom as well. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Grace Lee, and I am the current chair of the Systemic Racism Review Committee. Um, my pronouns are she, her, uh, and so forth. Yeah, Ephraim Freilich. Uh, I'm also a member of the Systemic Racism Review Committee. And I believe we have Miss Gail Ch Cheney on the line as well, who is listening in today. Is there a way to get her on the video? I know she might have wanted to participate and try answering questions. She's coming over now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as Mr. As Mr. Barr said, oh, actually, Ms. Cheney, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello, I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Gail Cheney and I'm a member of the SRRC. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Barr said, uh, we're here to request a change to our charter. Um, currently, we are charged with reviewing active policies that the assembly is reviewing as well and looking for systemic racism. Um, the thing about systemic racism is that it's systemic and it doesn't exist in a nice package um, presented to us by the assembly. And so we're requesting that today what we are able to do is instead look at existing policy, existing ordinances, whatever it is, um, allow us to take a closer look at those and, and then present possible recommendations to the assembly if we find anything that we find of value. Now, um, this would be in addition to our current duties. And so we will continue to review ordinances as they come. Um, but on top of that, we would use half of our meetings to look into, uh, say for land use or um, some, you know, whatever thing that the Systemic Racism Review Committee finds to be relevant and just take on projects as they come is kind of our hope, so. Yeah, if I could add, I'm, I think, the newest member of the committee, um, and immediately upon joining, you know, I've seen great conversations happening, but it, we would run into um, roadblocks, right? The toolkit, we would be reviewing individual pieces of legislation um, wh where someone would flag it, um, we would have a conversation and realize with our toolkit, it wouldn't meet the threshold to uh, move forward on anything because that individual piece of legislation isn't systemically racist, right? But it perhaps touches on a larger issue, but we were veering outside of our charge every time we would have those conversations. And so quite quickly, it became clear that we needed to come have a conversation with you all to, to figure out how to expand that, how to fix that. And because there were conversations that the committee was trying to have, right? And clearly wanted to have as directions folks wanted to go, um, but you know we were constrained. And so, here we are um, looking to figure out a way where we can continue the good work, but again, expand that um, and, you know, more holistically look again, not to belabor the word at the systems of racism um, that could be occurring um, in the community. So thank you. Okay. Um, who has questions or thoughts, comments, uh, anything for the committee members? Uh, uh, Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, thank you both for coming, or all three of you. Sorry. Um, could you give us maybe um, a memorable example of what you just described? Like you ran into it, the conversation was great, but since you were outside the charge, you had to stop. You just gave us maybe one or two examples so that. Thank you. Ms. Lee. Yeah. Mr. Freilich. 
yeah, through the chair. Uh, I, I mean, one off the top of my head, uh, Chair Lee mentioned it, um, land use, right? Land transfers, those situations where we wanted to talk about how the land transfers are decided and made in the community, um, whether priority was given or whether right of first refusal was given or really how those conversations happened, whether there was a system, a process that was followed, right? Um, and, you know, that immediately upon starting to have that conversation, we're falling outside of our duties, right? Uh, but I believe there's an important conversation to be had, right? If, if given the opportunity to have it, but that, that one stands out immediately. Um, also, you know, the boards and commissions, you know, we wanted to have conversations really about the systems of how, how we advertise, um, how we choose what the processes are for community engagement to bring new members in, of the community onto boards and commissions. Um, but <laughs> that was not within our charge either, right? And so very quickly, we conversations with Mr. Barr, he was, you know, he would give us soft redirection. Um, so thank you. And just to add to that through the chair. Ahead, uh, thank you. Uh, is, is that we're not expecting to, we're not going in um, expecting to find systemic racism. We just want to be able to ask the questions to see if we can, um, we are, we are looking at everything we are supposed to be looking at. Um, but when we see only a piece of a puzzle, which is um, the ordinance that's in front of us, like specifically as to the, uh, let's say the board one had to do with the Parks and Recs Board, I believe we're changing the number of members that were gonna be allowed. And it made a lot of sense as to why that was in front of us and why you guys considered it. Um, people, we, we didn't have community engagement and we didn't have people wanting to be on the boards and that all absolutely made sense, but we wanted to ask the question of, well, what does that mean for the community as a whole? Do they get the representation they need? Is the right community is getting the representation? Has there been outreach? And those questions are outside our current charge. And so those were the questions we wanted to ask. And, um, we were unable to, because of the wording of our, uh, of the ordinance that created the community. Hey, well, Gita. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, mine's kind of more of a statement than than a question, um, but you know, as as the liaison for for the SSRC, SRRC this this go around, um, really interesting to learn and and having you all know that I work in this space on a daily basis, uh, the space of um, racism, the space of equity. Um, but as we're thinking about what the charge has been given to this body, it really is on the institutional. Uh, racism level. And when you're thinking systems, you have to think about the why of why we do the things that we do. And I think that um, a lot of what's in here gives us the why, the ability for the SRRC to be able to look into the why of, of why does the, the city, the CBJ do the things that they do? Why is this process set up the way it is? Instead of looking at the what, because they're currently looking at the what, they're looking at the this is what we're doing. This is the ordinance that we're doing. And, and as was said, you know, looking at a piece of a puzzle instead of looking at the system as a whole. And so when I define system, I define the umbrella, not, not an individual piece. And so I'm, I'm thankful that, that this is a, a trajectory that, that they've set themselves on. And I think that it really makes sense to me in terms of how I describe systems when I'm, when I'm having this conversation on a regular basis. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Treem. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I also will, I guess, start with a, a statement. Um, I am fully supportive of these, uh, the proposed changes, because I think every conversation that we've had with the SRRC since its inception, which I cannot believe was already three years ago, um, this is this is what's come up, you know, every every time, every year. So I I fully support making these changes. And when we did, um, when we started this, when we had these conversations three years ago, we talked about, let's get this established and then we'll see how it goes and we can make changes. And so let's, let's do that. Um, would you, since we haven't had one of those joint meetings, would you permit me a little question that's slightly off of this topic? Sure. Thank you. Um, we're about to head into the budget season. Do you guys have a a plan for how the SRRC is going to tackle that? Thank you. I, I can't say that we've made any sort of plan as to how we're going to tackle that. Our work sessions have been very focused on um, getting this in front of the committee. Um, however, one of the things that was discussed was our desire to review the budget. Um, I know that previously we could 
look at the budget as they came um, to us, like as once you guys were done and you guys had talked about it, we can look at it, but we wanted to be able to be more proactive in um, coming to the meetings and uh, looking at the actual documents, having that explained to us by staff so that we can get some questions answered and being able to actively maybe advise the assembly instead of doing it after the fact. Yeah, and thank you, Charlie. And I, I think so far in our conversations, uh, what we've talked about is the desire to look at the budget holistically, right? To like actually, you know, lift up the hood and like like Charlie said, not do it in kind of pieces, incremental pieces, but like, you know, it, it's a it's a bold play for our lunch times on Wednesday or Tuesdays, but uh, to actually, you know, try to holistically look at it and. Um, not again, not just in individual pieces that come across um, and take more time to uh, look at the systems yet again. Yeah. Thank you. It's interesting. I thought you were look, going to look at the budget. But did you looking at the budget? So I, I don't really quite understand that. But anyway, we don't have to go back there. And um, did Ms. Wall. Oh, no, you did yours. Um, Ms. Ms. Hale, I have her. Oh, Ms. Wall, Ms. Wall, did you do yours? Okay, then you're next. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I I echo my um, committee's comments here. Uh, my experience as the liaison, um, I think, in addition to pointing out what um, the committee members and Wahagidak and Ms. Treem said, um, I found that. I got to sit on in on a rich discussion and then there was it was hard to translate it back to the assembly because the only kind of mechanism they had to communicate with us was yes or no. And so um, I feel like this will provide a richer kind of means of communication that can be helpful for us as as we work. Um, my question for you all is about kind of. Um, is a little more about that communication. When I first got involved in CBJ, I joined Juno you know, Commission on Sustainability and I kind of got to the first meeting and I said, does the assembly send us stuff to look at or do we send them stuff to look at? And so um, we've been sending stuff for you to look at. Now you're going to be sending stuff for us to look at. Is Do you think it would be helpful if we are working on an issue and we're like, we could get your feedback from this group do you want us to send send you stuff or do you think you can you got enough going on Ms. Lee. um thank you uh thank you for that question i mean yeah i think we're open to it and we're what we're trying to do right now is to define define who we are we are a pretty young committee and we're really gung-ho and we really want to do the work and so if that ends up being really helpful, then then please give it to us and let us try. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think that's what we're asking is for room to try and maybe fail, maybe succeed, but um, we all do we all do want to do this work. And so, yeah. Okay, M um, Ms. Hale and then Mayor Weldon, and then you're next. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, um, Ms. Lee and committee members. I really appreciate your being here and the incredible effort and job you've done with this with this new committee, this young committee, as you say. Um, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, we, we, we instituted the Systemic Racism Review Committee uh, during early days of COVID, as I recall, um, in a pretty high pressure kind of way and environment. And I think some of us were, a lot of us were not really sure how it would play out. And I think that some of the frustrations and difficulties that you've had um, have been the result of perhaps this coming very quickly, and as I said, during COVID, during a very charged time, um, and and in some ways, perhaps it wasn't as well thought out as we, the assembly, could have have provided or could have produced. 
it it's just making me wonder. I mean, when I think of, and I agree completely with what you're talking about with your frustrations. I've often thought um, that the budget, for example, and how things are budgeted, um, who gets money, and in what you know. As many of you know, I rode the bus for a year and a half, and the bus I don't think gets enough money relative to a lot of other things in the community, and a lot of um, a lot of disadvantaged people ride that bus. But what I'm wondering is if there's some way that we can um, run exa an example through a process that what the process might be, um, have some kind of a work session, even invite the public to contribute to how we might take this the next steps. I'm a little bit worried that we have our little think tank and I know your guys' think tank is very much more informed in, in these ideas than the assemblies is and I very much appreciate Hoggy Doc talking about the why and the umbrella, but I'm just worried that by making inserting a few changes, we might still miss some really good opportunities, maybe things that we can learn from other communities if we just make these changes and then throw it back out there for another three years. Thanks. Ms. Lee, any comments on that? Or yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, well, while you were talking, uh, Member Hill, I was thinking about how. What we're asking for is actually a very small change. We wanted more <laughs> than this. Um, I know that we are the Systemic Racism Review Committee, but with racism comes classism, with other issues. And we always fight against that. Like we're always hitting the wall where we're like, well, this seems like a class issue or this seems like a um, disabilities issue specifically. And we, you know, we realize what our charter is and we realize what our name is and decided that this would be broad enough for now for us to play with expanding out of what currently existed. So I I always welcome comments from anybody who is interested in trying to make this better. And I do think that there should be maybe more community input and more, um, um, you know, whatever we need to make it better. Uh, but right now, I, I believe that as a committee, we are pretty um, handcuffed and very limited because the original language was so limiting that without these changes now we are a bit ineffectual in what we are able to do for the assembly so uh anyway mr failure yeah, and I, sorry and I, Go ahead. I would just add um well a originally to assembly member wall's uh question any i think the more communication the better um, but, you know, with regard to these changes, you know, that additional, that last additional clause, clause five, is pretty expansive within the realm of systemic racism, right? Obviously, it doesn't do what Ch uh, Chair Lee is talking about of saying expands it to any, any social issue possible, right? But within the realm of systemic racism, it says review existing policies selected at the discretion of the committee to advise, right? That that opens it up to really any CBJ policy for us to give us the opportunity to just to look at it and, and review it. And if necessary, provide y'all with a report to it, right? A report about it. And so like, I'm not sure, um, Assembly Member Hale, how much more expansive we could get within the scope of systemic racism in the city and borough, you know, right? Um, and, you know, we, we went back and forth about this with staff as well. And like, this seems like it kind of covers everything we kept asking, well, would it cover this? Would it cover this? This seems like it would. And so I more input, the better, I suppose, right? From my perspective, but I think this this does what everybody on the committee was hoping it would do. Okay, um, Madam Mayor. And thank you members of the SRRC for being here tonight. Um, good discussion. Um, and I appreciate Walhog Doc talking about the why. I guess um, my question would be, it's probably along the lines of Ms. Hale is, we went from very specific to now very, very general. And um, I, so I guess I would be a little concerned at the selection process and trying to narrow down the topics. For instance, you made, um, talked about land use and um, the attorney spoke up and said, well, some of the things about legal issues, and I also know that you guys are interested in elections. Well, elections is a broad topic. So I don't know if um, we should have you, I don't know if the chair and I should meet, and somebody else maybe, 
or if we just have you guys look at our goals and say we're interested in topics and our goals and trying to figure out a way that's good use of your time, our time, and staff time. Um, we've made concerted effort to stay in time with our goals this couple, last couple of years. So um, I'm trying not to clip your wings because uh, I don't want to make any topics that you guys poke at, but at the same time, I, I don't want you guys to do an endeavor that gets you into um, a lot of your time and then you bring it to the assembly and it's not necessarily a priority for the assembly. So that's my question to you is how would you narrow down some of these topics and um, take you talk about citizen input or any other way you can think of? Madam Mayor, just so you know, you're coming out in and out a little bit. So um, if you talk more, make your mouth be by the microphone. Thank you. Um, Ms. You guys, any Ms. Lee, any comment? Yes, thank you, Dr. Chair. Um, so I, I would I think that would be helpful if there was a list of um items that the assembly was interested in um that was the goals. And then that would at least help us narrow down what we um might want to look at. For example, the budget coming up is probably something we should prioritize and then and we can take a look at it. Um the thing about systemic racism, though, is that if it exists in the system and we find it in land use or elections or whatever, it should be of interest to the assembly. And so I think that while the charge is very broad and while the charge is much broader than it was before, um, that is what we need in order to effectively do our job as a committee. So I, I do love the idea of narrowing down what we look at so we're not off in the weeds somewhere. And the staff has been fantastic about that. Um, but I think sometimes you might need to go on a little bit of a goose chase to catch the goose. So. Okay, Ms. hughes Candies. Thank you, Madam Chair. The good thing about going last is I can say Everyone else really encapsulated it. And thank you for speaking with some authority. And um, yes, that has been a point of frustration because we don't want to set something like this up and then just get a back pat to say, yep, nothing you're doing is racism because we know that's not where it will be. It won't be neatly packaged. Um, the budget is a thing just because the budgets come up. I will say that in the first year the thought was because the budget is in the current scope how on earth are they going to tackle the budget because it takes so much hand holding your first year as an assembly member to look at that and it is probably the most complex thing we do so i'll just say as kind of a, a statement i guess as i'm excited that we're going to improve the scope or it feels like we're going to improve the scope that um for my part, I would love, yeah, really attention on the budget because I do believe the sort of, you know, show me where you spend your money and I'll show you your values. Um, and so there's probably something to find there, not intentionally, but the the why, the what. Um, a question for you, you mentioned, I think, uh, Tuesday afternoon lunch hours, and I don't know how often you are meeting now, um, and I don't know how you feel like you are keeping up with what we send over. Um, could you speak to a little bit about uh, how your quorum's doing, how much you're meeting, and whether expansion you see as an issue, or how you'll balance that with keeping up with what we're doing now? Ms. Lee. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I, I won't lie, we do have struggles with quorum. We do have struggles with having members um, not only show up, but we'll have five with five members currently, and I believe we have room for seven uh, if I'm not miss if I'm not uh, miss speaking. but but the ones who show up, <laughs> we'll tell you we we are willing to put in the work. We currently meet, I believe once a month. Um, on a Tuesday at lunch. And that's all it takes for us to review the ordinances that you all provide to us. So 
I believe that if we did get the expansion language, we would definitely have to meet a lot more, um, maybe twice a month, and we would have to do our independent kind of work behind the scenes so that that weight is not on the staff as well. Um, but it would it would involve additional work from all parties. So I can I can tell the assembly that. Okay, uh, Mr. Smith. Oh, did you have a follow up, Ms. Huskanis? Okay, Mr. Smith. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thanks you all for being here and for the work you do. Um, I guess I'm 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 curious too about process and just you know resources that you might need. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's like best practices or are there like contractors that help guide on this type of work or is this just like, I just don't know. So I'm just wondering, you know, are you with this change in process, would you expect, um, and this may be for staff too, but just like what kind of, what kind of additional staff time would we be needed? Should we think about looking at, you know, getting and getting a contractor to help? Anyway, I'm just curious curious about what that work like what that what the resources needed to do the work it is um is that for that could be for these guys do you or, or do you Ms. Lee do you have a comment on that thank you <laughs> sure that's the question I actually asked uh staff and um I don't remember what the answer was unfortunately so I would defer okay to Mr. Barr or Mr. Watt whoever's jumping in <laughs> Hi, Deputy Mayor. I think we will both answer and you might get uh, two different flavors. Um, you know, I think the, the the city does a lot of complicated things. We have many, many programs um, and we have a lot of inertia um, in that, in, you know, in any given program. And that inertia has been built up over time um, through interaction with um, legal requirements, elected bodies, uh, public desires, fiscal realities. Um, so, so in, in any program, uh, there's a story on why we do things the, the way we do it. So um, any dive into um, what the municipal, municipality does and why it does it really has to be with the experts, which are staff. It's the department directors, um, Mr. Barr, um, Mr. Palmer. It's that it's that blend of um, history and experience, and law and inertia, really. I mean, I don't think, you know, if we had outside uh, consultants, they would just turn right around and query staff. Bar, any other comment? Are you good? Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I, I could just maybe give you a little bit more specifics on what we do right now. So, um, for each piece of legislation that we bring before the, but for each piece of legislation that the assembly introduces that goes before the SRC, um, staff touch that in a variety of ways. So, um, you know, if you asked me to ballpark how much time we spend, I'd say somewhere in the neighborhood of half an hour per per item that's get, get that gets introduced. It varies depending on the complexity of the legislation, um, depending on how many subject matter experts in the departments need to touch it or not. Um, I will tell you that the clerk touches every single one of them. So she's the clerk in question is not here tonight, um, the deputy clerk. But um, but uh, uh, you know if if we added to that by um, doing a deep dive into various policy issues that the committee selected, I think um, I think it would just depend on what issue we were dealing with as to how much time it would take. Okay, we're on round two of most folks, but so I have a question, and and that is about time. Um, and I wonder if um, we added policies, which seems like, as Ms. Hale said, when we passed this ordinance, it was we were trying to do something, and and then we were looking to the committee to say, well, this would be better. So that's where we are now, and so that's great. So I wonder if you just stop doing the legislation um, since so far it's, I think it takes staff time. I mean, what, what would you think of that? Um, and only, do, only do it if, I don't know, something so that the staff wouldn't have to do the, that. I mean, the budget itself would take, I mean, it takes us hours and hours and hours and meetings and hours of meetings to do the budget. So 
the only practicable way to to do that would be for somebody from the SRC to come to our finance meetings because the staff can't redo finance meetings, right, for you. So I'm just trying to figure out what can be taken off your plate if, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and you have two attorneys in front of you. So we're very much into the language of the, of the uh, change that we're requesting. And if you look at number two, you can see that it reviews pro proposed legislation, including the budget selected at the discretion of the committee. So it does actually allow us to make the decisions as to what we think would be, it, it gives us a lot more, more authority than the previous one does. And it allows us to make the decisions, have us show up to the meetings and go, we're flagging this for us to talk about. So that maybe the staff does not have to do, like uh, you suggested every single right. um, ordinance that you all pass. So it's we have to figure that out how, what the process for that would be. So they wouldn't have to do it before you anyway. Yeah. Okay. That's, that seems fair. Yeah. There, there would have to be, th sorry, through the chair, there'd have to be some sort of pre-meeting where we identify pieces of legislation, right. That, that have been introduced and then move forward with those things. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We're on second round and I have Ms. Treem, then Mayor Weldon, Ms. Hale and Ms. Hughes Candies. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, actually, Mr. Smith's question made me think of something because I think there are kinds of there. This we're not the first community to try to do something like this. So I think there are maybe best practices out there. Do you guys have training? Do you get training? Do you want training? But actually, that wasn't my question. Um, I, I would like you to answer that. My other question, briefly. Um, nobody's mentioned the sunset date. I assume you guys have a desire about the sunset date as well. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Freilich. Looks like you're reaching for your microphone. Through the, through the chair. Um, yeah, we do have uh, opinions and thoughts about the sunset date. We we thought it was best to address kind of the charge and fix ourselves and then talk about the sunset date. Uh, but we all, I think, have consensus that we would like to continue. Um, and, you know, we, but there's also consensus around these changes as well, right? But we, there was some concern about, requesting um a, a a you know moving out the sunset clause before we were able to kind of prove our worth in the near term with what we're doing we're what we're requesting here right now i think was the initial thinking there yeah and then uh, regarding training i think i would call well all good doc to go train us <laughs> ms lee did you want to say something yes just go ahead chair yes please on training from anyone who is qualified did no were you saying did you want to say something oh i i did You're okay right. great okay oh sorry i i was looking down the thing and i wasn't paying attention miss <laughs> miss stream um i i have no doubt that will all could do a fantastic training um i do think there are resources out there that are specific to the budget that i've seen so those also might be um good for the committee to have okay mayor walden I'm going to shut off my video and see if that helps any. Um, we, a while ago, we talked about um, the SRRC and the General Human Rights Commission and possibly combining those, but I have heard since that the SRRC doesn't think that's a good idea. Would you guys speak to that, please, and tell us your preference? Go ahead, Ms. Lee. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, we, there was a bit of a discussion about that, but I believe our our goals are different enough and ours is focused enough uh, or different, sorry, different enough and ours is focused in one way while theirs is a bit more, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, like, um, I don't I mean, I'll just say broader, like theirs is broader. Even though ours would broaden, it would still be, regard. it would still specifically talk about systemic racism. So I know that there was talk about possibly merging the two or talk about, um, having the committees work together, but I do think that these two different goals are different enough that they merit two different committees. So I don't, I think there were other discussions, but that's what I remember from it. So yeah, okay. Mayor Walden, you're good. Uh, Ms. Hale. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna return, I, I I appreciated what you said, uh, Madam Chair, about maybe not legislation, and then also appreciated what Ms. Lee said about uh, being very specific and, and selecting specific legislation that you work on, and and that makes sense. 
I, I'm going to return again, though, to kind of what I had said initially, which is a lot of this conversation um, is based on the assumption that the initial legislation had the right form or was doing the right thing. Um, and so we're going to plan on building on that initial legislation. And in my mind, and I think Ms. Treem talked about other, or maybe Mr. Smith talked about other communities that might be doing things that are similar and what are best practices. I, I do think that reviewing uh, certain policies is probably starting to really get at the meat of what we're trying to get at. But I'm not convinced that this is the, the, the right vehicle that we've got right now. Um, I think that it, we have an opportunity to really think about how we want this to go. Um, for example, I think some of the reports that I've uh, reviewed from the Systemic Racism Review Committee haven't been conclusive enough for me. I can't really ferret out what the SRRC is actually um, advising with some of the reports that I've seen, and it's been quite a while. So do we want to spend more time actually in an ordinance thinking about that? Um, do we want to have, I agree that it's very good for the SRRC to say, these are the policies that we want to review. But I think as an assembly member, um, you know, if we get six great big, huge issues and we're gonna try to solve them all in one year, it's not gonna work. We just don't have enough of us and our time and staff time to do that. So do we wanna come up with it within the actual legislation? Do we wanna come up with a process where um, the a certain number are reviewed or a certain number are agreed upon, that sort of thing? I, I don't want the assembly to say, oh no, we don't care about that matter because I want the SRRC to say, we care and you need to care. So that's important, but do we want to try to put some kind of, of uh, different framework around the work that the SRRC is doing and that interaction with the assembly. This is an opportunity to do that. Um, and I feel like we didn't have a good opportunity the first go round. Ms. I'm not, did you wanna respond? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, through the chair. Uh, okay, there, I think there were three comments in there that I wanted to address, but it, I wanted to start with the I understand that as an assembly member, it is up to all of you to make a decision on who we are and what we do as a committee. Um, and I do respect that the the desire to maybe kind of start from scratch and do something that's better, you know, maybe better and more um, ideal. But I also, we also want to do the work and we want to do it now. <laughs> we don't want to do it once you guys figured out the perfect committee and the wording for the perfect um, everything. And so what we're asking is maybe then that these changes happen so that we can we can go out and find that information for you. Because right now we can't even do that. We can't even go and find out how to make make this make the committee better. Um, and so so that is kind of our first the reason why we are requesting this language and maybe not going out and searching for you know what language that may be 10 times better so I, I, that's the first thing um the second thing i wanted to say is that the reason why our recommendations have been so kind of vague which i completely agree with member uh hill is because of our limitations and so our hope is that by getting these changes we can find out what we can do uh and make better recommendations the last one is that i think that we we as a very small committee, we are five people, we will not be able to come up with six things. We just <laughs> won't. Just naturally, that just doesn't happen because of the limitation of our time and our jobs. And so um, I would be very happy if we can get through the budget this year, and that would be our one project that we focus on. Um, so there will be natural barriers to what we are able to do, um, just based, even though our interests might be infinite and eternal i know that naturally there are barriers and that that exists as well um and so i would like miss cheney has her hand up. i was just going to say miss cheney did you want to respond to that or say something so just so folks know my background is organizational development and you guys are bringing up a ton of things in my wheelhouse 
But for me, the way that I look at this is change takes time. And the kind of change that we're making here, you know, you asked the committee, you had them create a tool. It's a great tool, but we don't have a lot of data to put in that tool. So we need to create the right kind of data to help us make the decisions that we're putting forward. So that's also kind of one of the pieces that I've been thinking about is we want to work from data we have and not data we don't have. Um, and also this kind of change just takes time. And I appreciate the effort and the goodwill of the committee to do this work because it isn't easy. So I just wanted to remind people that, you know, I think we're doing it the right way and we're, we're taking our time and we're thinking about what we're doing and we're exploring what our strengths are as a committee and as an assembly. So thank you. One thing I'll comment, several people have mentioned about other communities and other committees. All I know is when we did start this, we looked and there you were it of this. So was there wasn't, maybe there's more now, but um, you could find that out, but um, yeah. there weren't at the time. Th through the chair, there's, there's uh, not other systemic racism review committees. There's plenty of racial equity, um, you know, ad hoc right. working groups in different communities around the country and social justice groups, but there's no systemic racism review committees that I've been able to find in pretty okay, fairly great. extensive research. Okay, I have Miss Hughes Scandy since other people had their hand up again. Um, Thanks, Hughes Scandy. Madam Chair. I uh, also realized that I believe I see we've got even more on the Zoom now, so I neglected um, in my last comment to say a heartfelt thank you because we know it takes time to do stuff and we really, down to a really committed five, we really appreciate your commitment and your desire to do this work. So big thanks. Um, I'll just also say I um, I absolutely hear you, Ms. Hale. Um, and. I'm not one to say, let's not get it right. But I agree that sometimes we also, you know, because we are not capable of doing so many big lifts over the course of a year, I am personally inclined a little bit to broaden this out and see how it works, knowing that I'm sure we will hear from you guys if it feels like it's not going well. And I'm sure we'll hear from staff if it's, actually this opened up a can of worms for this reason and we should dial it in that way and we can revisit it. So I'm personally more inclined to say that's great. Um, and since I have two lawyers, which I forgot <laughs> sitting in front of me at the table, they walk among us. Um, I was curious if you could elaborate why you deleted three on resolutions. Is it that you never have pulled a resolution or? Who wants to talk to that one? Is that really? I might be. Ms. Lee? Really stupid or, question, but. Oh, Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the reason for removing three is actually fairly pedestrian. It's that uh, you do resolutions in one meeting. Um, and so there's ah. not an opportunity for the SRC to review them because we don't have them until the one meeting where you do them. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I was just curious. Um, Madam Mayor. Um, Reading the room, I don't know if the questions are stopped or not, but I just wanted to say we appreciate the SRC and thank you, Ms. Cheney. That was helpful, your last comment. Um, but you've given us lots to think about and um, things to ponder. And um, I would prefer if uh, we keep thinking about this a little bit and keep this in the community of the whole for at least another meeting, if unless everybody's. Uh, opposed to that, but um, right now I think that we have some things to think about and uh, just appreciate all the discussion again tonight and uh, I would make a motion to keep this on the cow for one more time and see if we can uh, uh, continue um, this thought process and this discussion. Okay, uh, stand by Madam Mayor. I wasn't sure, uh, were there other questions? Yeah, uh, hold on. Um, Ms. Treem has another question. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor, for letting me ask so many questions. Um, I, I'll say, Madam Mayor, I would love it if we could get our joint meeting scheduled. I know, or sometime in the near future, I know we're about to become really busy, but um, I think a joint meeting would be good. And I was thinking of that because I, I um, completely understand Ms. Hale's concerns about um, 
you know, the, the scope or what your choose, what the committee might choose to uh, focus on. And I was thinking rather than address that in the legislation, maybe that's something we could address in a joint meeting where we, you know, direct or advise, um, and it might make this process a little easier. So I guess that wasn't really a question other than to Madam Mayor, could we please have a joint meeting at some point in the near future? Madam Mayor. Madam Chair, um, I was thinking along the same lines as Ms. Treem, and maybe that's something we could do that uh, um, between the two, um, the two bodies, we can come up with a little bit of a framework of um, some of the topics to discuss. And um, again, not trying to clip anybody's wings, we certainly want to look at anything that might perpetuate systemic racism, but at the same time, we do have to be realistic with everybody's time. Excuse me. So we could have that meeting before it comes back to the COW or something. Is that what? Yeah. Did someone else want to speak? I'm sorry. I heard. Some... I, Pardon yeah, me. I just. Mr. Nance. Yeah. Sorry. I'm I'm a member of the SRRC. And thank uh, you for joining us. Sure. Yeah. It took me a while to get my face and my voice on here, but congratulations. Uh, my my interest is. Uh, to be proactive rather than reactive. The mode we've been in is reactive. Someone hands us a uh, an ordinance that's been done and says, okay, well, find something wrong with it. And I think our, our interest has been, let's look farther back, maybe in the weeds and see if there are matters that have systemic res racism that we can correct before they, uh, before they be, you know, get out in front in in the form of a of an ordinance. So my interest as a non-lawyer and non-government uh, worker is that we be we be uh, proactive and e efficient and effective. So so I am interested in not having meetings that just grind on and don't produce don't don't really produce much um how long this this committee lasts who knows but whether whether it produces something is what's really important to me Thanks. thank you mr thank you mr um nance we definitely are not in favor of meetings that grind down <laughs> even though we do them all the time who who, who more people had their hands up. Ms. Wall. I was going to make a motion. A Madam Mayor made one. Did she take it back? No. Madam well, Mayor. I'm going to object to Madam Mayor's motion. Um, I, uh, I appreciate my committee members um, who want to get this right, but I think um, get this right, but I... Uh, feel like one thing we don't do enough of on this assembly is listening to um, our committees and the people who we are assigning as kind of the experts. Um, this committee's done a lot of work to figure out what this should look like. And based on my experience, it's right on. Um, we also have probably the foremost expert on this um, on our assembly, and she's already expressed her support of this language here. So. Um, I'll object to this motion and instead uh, introduce introduce it if this motion fails. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I don't know. I have a couple of conceptual. I have a couple of ideas that maybe would just be like, I don't know, but I could do them as like a conceptual amendment or I'll just lay them out. Uh, well, no, the, so far, wait, stand by, Mr. Smith. There's a. <laughs> there's a there's a motion on the table to continue working, which okay. your things would be. That's what we could do, okay. um, or not. Um, so motion. There's a motion on the table that Ms. Wall has objected to. Madam, okay. just just keep it here. Okay. To keep well, the if it stays here, then I can amend. I can actually get amendments drafted. Correct. Something. Absolutely. I mean, though, I'd be interested to put it out there just to see if I should. Okay, you can do that. Stand by okay. and see how this goes. Um. Anybody else have a comment? 
Uh, Ms. Hale has her little hand up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would uh, I, perhaps for just the reason that Mr. Smith has amendments that he might be interested in introducing. I um, I do think that if we can keep it in committee for one more committee meeting, uh, this just showed up. And so we haven't had time to work on it. We haven't had time to think about it. We haven't had time to kind of figure out what does this make sense? It was three years ago or almost three years ago at a very stressful time that this came through in the first place. And there were some, there was some debate about this. And we, I think a lot of the work that the Systemic Racism Review Committee has had to do is because we didn't put enough time and thought into it initially. And if we could have one round, if I could beg of those who think that we should just keep moving it on, if we could have one round where we could think about it and talk about it and talk with some of the SRRC members about it, um, it would certainly uh, help me as we move forward with this. All right. Any more comments on that, Mr. Bryson? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I've got to say, I'm. We need to move forward on this. Uh, I think delaying this in committee, um, we're going to. We can continue asking questions all day long. I would propose that we allow the SRRC to ask all these questions. They're wanting to do this work. They're wanting to uh, dig into it and find out what issues are underlying. And we could probably have as many meetings trying to figure out the best way for them to approach it. Whereas if we just let them go meet and try to dig into and see what they can find, it is a far more productive use of everyone's time to allow the group that wants to look into it to look into it. And so my recommendation as Ms. Hale or Mr. Smith might have some suggestions, um, my recommendation, bring it to the committee, allow them to incorporate your suggestions that will either help or hurt the group and let them go find stuff. I knew that this first thing, and I think I even said it out loud, it's not going to dig deep enough. There's no way that the city is ever going to write an ordinance that's overtly racist on the surface. We needed to do this from day one. We need to stop talking about it. Let this go. Let this group go do what they need to do. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Well, I'll get up. You had your um, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better than Mr. Brayson. Um, I, I would agree. Um, going to object as well. I think we're ready to move forward. And we've had we have four out of the five SRC members here that we've had time with uh, for the last hour or so having a conversation about this. And I think that they've made it clear what their intentions are uh, behind this this shift in their language um, for their directives and they've worked with staff they've had conversations how many meetings I, I feel like it was at least three three meetings having this conversation at the SRC level and I think that um, the the due diligence was was had at in those in those sessions and we've had our time with SRC and I think it's time to move it forward Mr. Smith thank you ma'am deputy mayor um, I'm good to move it forward but I'm when I hear an assembly member, ask and plead for more time. Um, I'm somewhat deferential to that. I guess there are times when there's not that kind of time crunch uh, or there's not that kind of availability. I guess I don't know if this one strikes me as something that we can take another meeting at. So I'll I'll vote in support of um, the, the members who are asking for more time to do some more work, though I think I'm fine with it, but that's how I'll be tonight. Thanks. Any other comments? Okay, Madam Clerk. Madam Deputy Mayor, and this is for Mayor Weldon's motion to keep this topic in um, Committee of the Whole for an additional uh, meeting. Ms. Weldon. Yes. And Mr. Bryson. No. Ms. Hale. Yes. Ms. Hughes Scandies. No. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Treem. No. Ms. Wall. No. Well, I'll eat all. No. And Ms. Gladyshevsky. Oh, no. Motion fails. Three eyes and six nays. So, Mr. Smith, you you have some possible amendments. Yeah, I'd like to just bring up a couple ideas, I guess, as we've been discussing this. 
Um, the first one is in paragraph two under duties. I, I don't know the best way to do this. I'm just gonna maybe throw it out in a concept. I mean, I can do it as a motion and then we can vote it up or down or whatever. If you have amendments, you, you go for it. I think we can grasp them. Um, the one I was gonna maybe do uh, is, yeah. Go ahead. The more specific you can be, the better. Very good, yep. On that under duties, paragraph two, reviewing proposed legislation, including the budget. I was thinking and open to feedback and hearing is um, selected at the discretion of the committee or um, at the request of an assembly member or the manager so that anyone essentially can say, hey, we'd like a, can you guys take a, could you take a look at this? But it's not a look at every single one. And what about the assembly, not an assembly member that we don't do things as a one person thing generally? Oh, that's totally true. Um, Ms. Tream. Um, I, I was going to maybe, well, I don't know if I'm objecting because I don't know if there's a motion, but I would prefer at the assembly instead of assembly member or the manager. M Mr. Watt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm um, kind of lack enthusiasm for that amendment uh, on two fronts. Um, if I, as the manager, if we thought we had a systemic racism issue, we'd bring it forward, right? So we're not going to ask the Systemic Racism Review Committee to look at something that we think is racist, right? We're going to we're going to bring that forward, and then on the assembly side. Um, We've got volunteers with, you know, a fairly limited amount of time and having nine individual pieces of direction is problematic. So I think the, the assembly as a body, if it wants to give direction, should do so as a body. Okay. So could you restate your yeah. uh, amendment? I'll just do that. Yeah. I would move that we amend and we can figure out the exact per perfect language, but adding after selected at the discretion of the committee or the request of the assembly or something like okay, that. Okay, that's the amendment. So, so uh, at, at the uh, selected at the discretion of the committee or at the request of the assembly. Is that your amendment? Um, Mr. Bryson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, as the assembly, couldn't we request this at, at will on any so anytime an ordinance uh, is passed, that we even have that that ability right now as the assembly to request that SSRC uh, review legislative that we just passed. I don't know that this adds an actual step because we already had we already have that privilege. Ms. Lane. Yeah, I'm gonna say that. I appreciate it's done with that. We haven't moved. Also, we haven't moved this, so we can't amend it yet. Oh. We're we're okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Lane, your comments on the uh, necessity of an amendment that set specifically says at the request of the assembly. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, that's that is up to the assembly. I mean, you can, I mean, you can add it. Uh, I I do echo that you already you already send the legislation to this committee, but if there was a, a separate topic perhaps that you were discussing at an assembly meeting and you wanted to send that topic to the committee, you know, maybe it's something that you don't normally send. I could see where that could have some value. Ms. Lane, this is specifically in the section about proposed legislation. So that's, um, Mr. Smith, you're, okay. Um, mi yes, you did. M Ms. hughes Candies. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for staff, just to beat a dead horse. Um, as the assembly, this is an appointed assembly committee. I am going to say I assume, always a bad idea. I assume that if the assembly asked a committee that we appointed to review something, that we could do that without that being in the charge and that staff would not, who are staffing that meeting say, this is outside your charge. You don't answer the assembly. Is that correct? Is that, that, is what correct I, that is what I asked Ms. Lane. Mr. Watt. 
That, that's right. I mean, the, the assembly can ask any of its committees to focus on something and generally they do. I mean, you appoint, you appoint them. I, I, maybe I would offer um, a question if you prefer to that the SRC's uh, project choices be a consultative project process, right? Do you, do you prefer them to select um, policies and, and on their own? Or do you prefer them to say, we're interested in, I heard the budget and land policies, and maybe you want to confirm that. Maybe you want those recommendations to come up and you say, yeah, that's good. Or maybe we have a different direction. Would you like you to focus? So maybe that's an area of discussion. Okay, Mr. Watt, you're commenting not on the, uh, not on the uh, motion. So we're going to, okay, Mr. Mr. Smith, I, you're, you're okay. We're going to vote on this. Um, we're going to vote on this. So, okay. So the amendment. Yeah, there's an objection. I raised for quite some time. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you're you uh, off the screen. You're a little. Yeah, go ahead. Um, question for Mr. Smith. Um, he's doing this for number two, but if he doesn't do the same thing for number five, they kind of contradict each other. Again, your uh, last little part was cut off. Say that last part again. I said for Mr. Smith, if he does this for number two and doesn't do this for number five, we're kind of contradicting themselves. Yep, the we're right now we're talking about the amendment for A2. It's to add the words or at the request of the assembly. You understand the motion, Mr. Bryson, you're talking about the motion. Okay, go ahead. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, I would say that this is a, perf a perfect example of systemic racism. The Systemic Racism Review Committee came to us and said we need to have a different set of rules and in order, Mr. Bryson, are you? I just feel like you're like I don't. I mean, I feel like you're pinging up. Yeah, Mr. So, Mr. Bryson, that's. Um, I wasn't referring to Mr. Uh, I apologize if it seems like I was singling out Mr. Smith. It was the whole course of action. We have the group that says we need the uh, different parameters, and yet here we are, systemically putting sideboards back on them, and then we're, we we want to continue the meeting to continue with sideboards and figure out what the best sideboards are. That's why I'm, uh, and I apologize uh, directly, Mr. Smith. Um, that, that's how I'm viewing it. We asked for different ability, let's give it to them, otherwise we're. Okay, um, we heard the motion and we're gonna vote on the motion. Um, Ms. McEwen. Just to clarify, and we're not keeping the words or the city manager in on that. That's correct. The exactly. amendment is after the word committee or at the or request of the assembly. I withdraw my amendment. Okay, never mind. Okay, Mr. Smith, you have another one? I would. I was, well, and, and I, this is why I'm talking about things being conceptual, Is and it was something like Mr. Watt had brought up, and something like, I don't think we, there's a require, is there a required joint meeting between the assembly and the SRRC annually or at any point it's anyway, a it's a practice i don't know if it's required but we do it the concept was something like at the a once a year joint meeting between the assembly and the src you know review collaboratively and discuss potential air anyway you i'd imagine that you'd bring ideas to us we'd say yes this seems good limit it based probably on like hey staff can do this and then kind of go forward but so that's how I'd like to phrase the, could you spread up the amendment like that? No, I just, but anyway, that's Maybe like, my, Ms. that's my, could that's we my take concept. A recess? Okay, we're gonna take a, a five minute break. And by, we're having technical issues. There we go. I'll have a snack. Okay, um, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I think my hope is with this, since it's not, you know, it's not drafted as an ordinance yet. My thought would be just to ask a question about an idea, and that is the one I was kind of speaking about earlier, where we, you know, it, at least once a year, the assembly and the SRC, um, you know, have a joint meeting, maybe discuss priorities and whatever. And anyway, just like a, in a collaborative set, in a collaborative fashion or something. And my, I would just wonder how the 
members of the SRC feel about just that concept? Um, Ms. Lee. So, oh, um, through the chair, uh, yes, we are very welcome to that concept. We love the idea of reporting or getting direction from the assembly on what the goals would be. So, we appreciate that as an amendment. Thank you. All right, Mr. Smith. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, I guess with that, um, I, I don't need to make an amendment. I'll just pledge to work with the attorneys and the members of the committee and um, before the Anyway, and we'll introduce it at the right time. Okay. All right. That sounds great. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, so uh, this will, the, oh, I guess there hasn't been a motion. I was just going to make a motion. I can't do that. Mr. Ms. Wong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move that uh, we direct staff to uh, create an ordinance for introduction that takes into account the changes um, provided in this memo. Any objection to that motion? Mr. Uh, Ms. Wall, I mean, Ms. Hale. <laughs> I object uh, uh, simply for the reasons that I stated earlier. Uh, I, I think what we just saw before we took that break is exactly why I wanted to stay in committee. And I know this the, the objection won't do anything now, but I will object on that principle. All right. Any other uh, objections or any no, other no. comments? I'm objecting um, also. I don't know if you can see my hand. Oh, yes, Madam Mayor, go ahead. For the same reason Ms. Hale said, we still have some discussion to do on this. We're going to see amendments on the fly at the assembly level. This doesn't sunset so till September. We have time, but for some reason, we're choosing to rush through this. And I just... Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Clerk, if you would call the roll. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. This is for the motion um, to have staff draft legislation to be brought back to the assembly. Ms. Wall. Yes. Ms. Treem? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Hughes Scandies? Yes. Ms. Hale? No. Mr. Bryson? Yes. Walal Kidok? Yes. Uh, Mayor Weldon? No. And Ms. Kladyshevsky? Yes. Motion carries eight to two, uh, eight, excuse me, seven to two, if I can count. My apologies. Whatever. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We, we have faith in you. Um, okay, we, um, we're going to move the iRide Alaska lease request up to the next item on the agenda, since there's folks in the room for that. Uh, Mr. Watt, thank you um, for coming. Uh, Deputy Mayor, this topic was forwarded by the assembly um you'll recall that the lands division received a request for a commercial use permit uh it was heard in lands went up to the assembly uh as this action would take an ordinance uh, and in the first step in that process would be making a motion to uh, direct the manager to uh, begin negotiations so the information that we pulled together a big thank you to uh, lands manager Blydorn, community development director McLean, deputy parks director Alpers, and tourism manager pierce this is kind of a co-written memo uh, by the four of them with a few uh, bits and pieces uh, from myself uh, in there as well um, we tried to uh, get all the information that you were asking about. Uh, there were questions about the original grants and the classification of the road and our adopted plans um, and community development policies and our policies on how we uh, manage trails and a little bit of the history on that. And um, there were questions about e-bikes and how e-bikes are uh, regulated. And there's a bill in front of the legislature. Uh, and we also received an updated uh, letter uh, from the iRide group, and they're here in the audience tonight and thank them for their attendance and their patience um, and their enjoyment of municipal affairs. Um, so we're looking for direction on uh, what to do. I think we've given you all the information we have, and um, I think we're available to answer questions, and I'm sure the applicant would be happy to answer questions as well. 
Thank you, Mr. Watt. Thank you to you and staff for getting um, all this information together that we had asked for. Um, are there any questions that you didn't get the answer to or uh, clarification anyone needs? Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, I was going to declare a potential conflict. Um, while I do have a business that sells uh, e-bikes, I'm not involved in tours, and it represents less than 1% of my gross annual revenue. I believe that I can be an impartial uh, assembly member and uh, be fair and balanced. Thank you, Mr. Bryson, for letting us know. Um, I see nobody has an objection to, for you for you participating, it appears. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor, or Deputy Mayor. Um, I didn't see it in the memo, but are there areas, are there recreational areas that do not allow commercial activities? Mr. Mm, he's hit his button uh, first. That's Deputy Mr. Watt. I, I don't know, but we could maybe uh, try and get a lifeline from uh, the parks director or maybe the deputy parks director. There is a trails plan that has that in it. Um, I don't know if it's not an ordinance that prohibited it, but it's a plan, Mr. Mr. Thank Smith. You. I did. I, I looked at that before, and I actually didn't. I don't think it. I don't think there's a restriction. I think I don't. I didn't see one that was you know commercial activities not allowed. Um, another one, maybe as we're getting a lifeline, is maybe it's just me and empty promises. But I feel like we've been saying to the community for a while, "Hey, you know, COVID. Let's." I mean, well, anyway, let we, but I mean, I feel like we've been saying to the community, while wow, we need, we'll have a conversation on this, on limitations on cruise ship. When and where, and what is that, where does that, where does that happen? Mr. Watt, that's you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Well, so certainly the where is here. Um, I thought we had a really good conversation at Lands Housing and Economic Development several weeks ago. Um, and in that packet, we put together a chart of uh, the growth of cruise ship visitation, and it was annotated with, you know, different events. And we've been wanting to have this discussion um, about tourism, about growth, about what's good for the community since the basically the day uh, I entered the manager's office, which was the week that we initiated um, litigation. So we spent three years in litigation. We did our VITF process, and then we had several years of COVID. And, and we just were not able to get back to it. Um, I really do think we need to have that discussion, particularly in light of um, the growth uh, that we're going to see this summer. Uh, the tourism manager and I have been working on some graphical representations about what tourism is and how it comes to the community. And we're kind of really anxious to get that um, to the, the uh, uh, assembly. So where is here and when um, is when we're able to prioritize that. And that's uh, staff and assembly. It looks like um, Mr. Schaff has answered, and he says, we follow TBMP, which restricts commercial use in certain areas, like Cope Park, for example. Otherwise, we follow the 30-year-old Trails Working Group recommendation yeah. and Parks and Recreation regulations for parks. Um, Madam Clerk, um, Mayor Weldon, I see her on this little screen, but not up there. Is there a way to get her up there? Because she has her hand up. Madam, uh, Ms., Ms., Madam Mayor, you have your hand up. I do have my hand up. So question for this particular um, request. Um, Madam, Madam Mayor, could you talk closer to your microphone? I'm talking as close to my microphone as I possibly can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so being out there um, several times, the parking lot would not support a van and a trailer. So where are they going to park? Um, they talked about we were going to get revenue from this. If we have to expand that parking lot, I can't imagine that there would be enough revenue to um, expand that parking lot. And while we're on the subject, what are they going to do about bathrooms? Miss, um, Mr. King, would you come on up and or whoever could answer that question? And if you would um, identify yourself for the record.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, James King, I live at 1800 Branta Road, Juneau, Alaska 99801. Uh, so the, our proposal is to not use the parking lot, but to start the tours down the road a ways. So you would park your van on the North Douglas Highway down the road somewhere? Right. What, what we're proposing to do is start out of the, uh, either the pull off right next to the boat launch ramp or in the parking lot of the boat launch ramp. Okay. Communicated with DOT about that. So. Sir, did you want to, and would you identify yourself so people can. Yes. Reuben Willis, 2912 Jackson road here in Juneau. I was just going to uh, elaborate and say, we have been in discussion with the DOT Lance Merrig in determining the appropriate place for us to start those tours and as James indicated that would be in the DOT right of way uh, that's permitted and we're allowed to do that it's in the parking lot area of the boat ramp and along the side where it's been widened substantially it's about 25 feet wide okay madam mayor did you have did you hear that you have a follow-up or you're good uh, my follow-up would be they mentioned in their first um, proposal that they were going to do a short hike. So that gives me concern if they park down by the boat ramp and get on their bikes, where are they going to put their bikes while they do a short hike? And the, the other question I had was in regards to bathrooms. Who's in the bathrooms? Mr. King. Madam Deputy Mayor, if I understood the question correctly it was about where would a short hike occur one of the things that we have proposed is that along the route there are some interesting destinations such as the small creek uh, near where the bridge is uh, and if we were to stop there to look at that and, and maybe go into the woods a little bit uh, at that point the bikes would be parked well onto the side of the road so any other users could go by. And then the uh, question of bathrooms. So uh, this, we have been working through the details of that. And if there's a need for that, usually in these shorter tours, um, they're expected to go to the bathroom before they get there, but uh, we may need to, to put a bathroom out there if that becomes an issue. Okay, hey, um, questions from anyone else on the panel here? Uh, Madam Mayor, you, did you have more? Madam Mayor, you, your hands up, go ahead. Oh, I did not, sorry, I should put mine out. Hang down. No. Okay, so you're done. Um, Ms. Treem. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. It looks like maybe they got some different information on the bathroom. So if, if you did get different information, let us know. Mr. King. So there are bathrooms out there. Um, and at the boat ramp there are, yeah. And at the boat launch that could be used. Okay. And who's, what are you pointing to? I said. Oh, Ms. Hale, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, I am uh, really torn on this, and I, I wish that we'd had more time to work on this because right now we're under an incredible time pressure. Um, if we hold it up, then it won't be able to happen this season. There, people have raised ha have valid concerns, but at the same time. Um, you know, I, I've just heard the mantra for so long that downtown is so full of tourists, I won't ever go there during the summertime. And um, and then when we want to, and also we kind of sell ourselves as a as a as a destination for independent tourists. And this is a kind of an independent tourist kind of thing to do. Um, but at the same time, as Mr. Smith said, we haven't really looked at this very globally and and people have raised some valid concerns i also want to reiterate what i said last time which is this is a pioneer road for a big commercial road so um i i i i worry i'm torn and i i, I just really don't know what we should what wish what we should we should do with this mr smith 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Mr. Manager, the, the funds to build the road <laughs> came from the state. Are there, were there any requirements or any, you know, if you don't do this, we take the money back type of thing? Mr. What? Uh, Deputy Mayor, I don't believe so. It's been a long time since I looked at the grant document, but that would be a really unusual thing in a state grant. Mr. Smith. Thank you. And back to the where and when conversation, let me add another question, another word in there, and that's the what. Do we, is this a, is the discussion on non-commercial areas, I mean, is that a comp plan thing? Is that, I mean, anyway, where, what is the vehicle to, to have that conversation? Uh, Mr. Watt. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure. Um, so, so certainly we try to talk about elements of tourism uh, at different times in different places. And we mostly talk about tourism in the context of the port uh, and port infrastructure. Um, and um, the, the visitor industry task force recommendations. Uh, tourism manager Pierce is, is working really hard uh, to try and get agreement on a uh, memorandum of agreement to move forward incrementally. Um, but what we have not done is figured out a process for talking about community impacts. Um, so a, a dock is a dock and the dock uh, results in uh, visitation, but what we have not figured out how to do is talk about what happens to people when they leave downtown and how is what are the pros and cons of that activity. And that's really hard. I mean, we have a 30 year old trails plan and it's it, and we have not as a community or as an assembly said, even said we're we want concentration or we want dispersion. We haven't even said that. So that's takes time. It's obviously not going to happen tonight. Mr. Bryson. Oh, no. Um, I think I have Ms. Wall. Didn't you raise your hand? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my questions for the manager. Um, in the memo, um, there's a list of considerations at the end. Uh, number one is CBJ, CBJ staff manage recreational use on city lands and can, can apply consistent conditions on the Pioneer Road to manage use if the assembly desires. Um, can can you talk to me about what this what this means? Like, are you com are you looking at the thirty year old plan and saying this is what we should do on Pioneer? Like, how what does it mean for you to apply? If we, if we just told you to go do that, what would what would you do? Uh, I think what we would do. So so this piece of land, I think we talked about this last time, is. Uh, it's unclassified. It's a it's a pioneer road in a gigantic tract. Um, it's not designated as a trail, but the public kind of treats it like that. So I think what would happen is we would try to apply um, commercial use of trail methodology best we could. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Wall. Thanks for that. And. Um... What about my understanding of conditional use permits or commercial permits, excuse me, um, is that there's like a window of time. What, I, what I'm wondering, like when people apply and then you consider them all at the same time, is that correct? You know, I'm thinking if we get one request today, are we going to get one, another request in a few weeks? And how would you manage that scenario? Mr. Barr is reaching for the microphone. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so in, in general, for, for parks and rec commercial use permits, at least, we, we do that. We, we gather them all at once and consider them at the same time. Um, the regular application period is actually open right now. It closes March 19th. Uh, we, we do have a period of time where late applications can be considered, too, um, after that, up until June 30th. 
Okay, I have um, Mr. Bryson and then Ms. Ms. Treem. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things, remind us uh, as we're having this discussion, trying to figure out the the, the outcome uh, for this business venture. Um, the first thing uh, I did like how it's um, activities like this are mentioned in the comp plan on uh, page 13, page uh, four or five on the bottom of it. I like how uh, it also is uh, uh, listed specifically in the 2015 economic development plan. So um, first thing, these guys have already done stuff that we said, these are the type of activities that we should see in Juneau. Had these gentlemen picked a trail, we wouldn't even hear of this. We wouldn't have seen it. The citizens wouldn't have had a, an opportunity to come and tell, tell us. The the reason why we're in this predicament is, is this particular business venture, well, <laughs> I don't want to speak for them, but they they picked a wider area to go to instead of a, a, a more narrow trail, um, say like uh, the John Muir Trail. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, commercial areas. Um, I was hoping that Mr. Manager had the answer to this. I don't believe that there are any permitted tr uh, tours past Auk Bay or the ferry terminal. Does Mr. Water, Mr. Barr have any idea about that? I, I do not. Um, Mr. Barr uh, is chewing through some sustenance. Uh, and I would also just say Ms. Pierce advises us that we are we are trying to update the trails plan, which is something we started during COVID and got derailed on, or before COVID, actually. Uh, Mr. Barr has maybe some information. I'll just note that um, for 2022, we issued one permit, it looks like, for Amalgam Meadows, Kayak Beach. Um, Just to finish. Mr. Bryson, another question? Um, what I'd like to point out is that the existing bike tours are more in the, in, they go down back loop road. So they're literally traveling on the roadway next to where Juno citizens are driving. We didn't hear anything about those bicycle tour permits, and they are in a far more obstructive way. The right in the middle of the valley, where sixty percent of the population lives, we have a, a couple of people that want to open another tour operation, which is at, is needed. There's not enough tour operations for all the visitors that come to visit us, and they went as far away from the community as they possibly could. Mr. Bryson, just a, a, at this point, we're asking questions, but we'll get to the uh, advocacy in a minute. You, do you have, did you have a question? Once again, I was confused at the statements versus questions. No, that's okay, Mr. Bryson. We're all, all over the place. Um, Ms. Treem, you have a question. Uh, no, I don't have a question. I also have some okay. statements. Let me just, any more questions for either the manager or the applicants? Okay. Uh, you have a question? No. Statement. Okay, we're now we're to statements. Mr. Bryson, you started, so you, you get, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I just, um, just because of the nuance of they picked a pioneer road versus an active trail should not allow uh, uh, enough citizen sentiment that because if we asked every Junoite which trail that they would be acceptable to allow tourism on there wouldn't be one trail in this community that they would allow tourism on we know that so um, I think these gentlemen have picked a good out of the way location that while some Junoites use it, I think that this is going to be one of the least visible tours because of the destination that they picked. And I think it'll have low impact, which is what our comprehensive uh, plan asked for. Uh, thank you for the time, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mr. Brazen, I have uh, once again followed up the procedure. We need a motion. Madam Mayor has a motion. So we know so we know what we're talking about. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move that we direct the city manager to continue negotiations and introduce an ordinance which would authorize use of this property. And to be quite clear, I'm sure not sure I would vote on that motion. Miss, Miss, a motion out there. Okay, uh, we we heard uh, authorize the manager to negotiate and 
that then when you get garbled, could you go back, go more? Uh, to continue negotiation and introduce some arguments. To do what? Which would authorize use of this property. Uh, for any length of time or? Uh, for one year. Thank you for being patient with my uh, problems with my internet. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, to have the manager negotiate and draft an ordinance to allow this activity as proposed for one year. Okay, is that correct, Madam Mayor? Uh, that is correct, other than uh, my statement that I'm not sure how I'm voting, but we need a motion on the floor. Okay, th fair enough. Okay, Mr. Bryson. Um, I was going to ask a question about the motion. Um, while it has a one-year sunset, could we have language in that that allowed for us to like review it so that if it wasn't problematic, we could continue so that we're not writing the language that they can only operate one year. We will allow them to operate for a year with review at the end of the year. How would we properly phrase that? I don't want to give them a define. You can only operate for one year. Um, it out at the end. It sounds like an, an amendment that would allow for a renewal or something. So is, is that your amendment? Uh, I'd like to have an add an amendment uh, to allow for a renewal after that period. Yes, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Madam Mayor, is that okay with you or do we have to vote on that? Well, but if she could change her, we're being, you know, it's, we're at a committee meeting, which is a bit of a hot mess, exactly. Let's um, vote on that amendment separately. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, go ahead. Let's vote on that amendment separately. Okay, so that's the amendment. Your yes, sir, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, it, it, sorry, did we say just one renewal, continuous renewals? Anyway, what was what was the what was the Mr. Bryson? What's uh, your I time? Not I had not thought real. that deeply into it. I didn't want to have the language to be only one year, which might be uh, prohibitive for like financing or uh, it could impact their a business to have only a defined year. So that way we could review it after a year. I, I think that that would be in a review, renewal um, review for renewal at the end of one year. Let, let me, um, since the mayor's motion is about negotiating with the, uh, applicants and drafting something which hasn't been drafted um, is something like this could be in the negotiation and drafting. So, Correct. so we may not have to have to be this specific. Move my, and then uh, we can amendment. dink with it when we see the paper. I'll remove my, okay. then Madam Mayor, uh, Deputy okay. Mayor. Um, Ms. Dream was anxious. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I I feel like every conversation about tourism since the pandemic, I am taking crazy pills because I went through a very public process where we got a lot of public input on all sorts of tourism related topics, including uh, North Douglas in the Visitor Industry Task Force. And we talked also about commercial permits on CBJ land, and I would bet a lot of money that there is a memo from Mr. Palmer in one of those packets that outlines probably every question that we've asked tonight. Um, we, we have gone over this. It's, I think it's unfair to claim that we haven't done that. Um, and that being said, when we did the Visitor Industry Task Force, there were people who well, one one outcome of that was uh, the recommendation that we spread out tourism, um, spread things out across the city, and I think that this does accomplish that. Another thing that you know I I can report from that process is that there were a lot of people who had strong feelings about tours on North Douglas and tours at Eagle Crest. And I brought that up 13 months ago when we discussed the gondola and I said, you guys are going to make a lot of people angry by going forward with this. And this body chose to go forward with the gondola anyway, with the assumption that it depends on summer tourism. So I, 
in my view, we've already made that. We had that decision process done with when we decided to purchase the gondola, and we didn't have a public process then, even though you know I asked for it. Um, and I, so we've seen the number of emails that we've gotten today that it, you know, people are upset about that. But that being said, I actually, I think this is a great way to spread things out. I think one year is a perfectly reasonable amount of time to try it. And we have, we're always going to have conflicting interests in this community when it comes to tourism. Nobody is going to want it in their backyard. They're going to want it in somebody else's backyard. Um, and this is, I think, a, a good compromise and a good place to put a tour and I'm all for moving this process forward and I'm frankly a little frustrated that um, it, it's been so fraught because like Mr. Bryson said if it had been a, a different classification of land this would not have happened and it would have been much easier. Okay I have uh, I think Ms. Wall and then Mr. Smith. Yes. Yeah go ahead Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, a question I got confused um, after the motion was made. I, you know, I'm like hoping we never have to see this again, but then it sounded like there's negotiations and then we see the details. Do we see the details of whether the lease gets continued and how many people are on the trail or we'll see the ordinance? We, it needs to be an ordinance. So we'll see the ordinance. So in the, the ordinance is going to have that level of detail. Okay. So, Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Smith. Maybe I'm dense and lacking a flow chart on how we decide tourism, but I just searched the Visitor Industry Task Force report for the word north, and I found it one time. It was under recommendations, and it says plans for infrastructure development, including design standards and analysis of growth and impact, should be completed for other areas outside of the downtown waterfront where tourism growth is occurring or could occur, such as Oak Bay and North Douglas, Eagle Crest. Um, I guess I don't necessarily, maybe I'm misunderstanding or didn't follow the process enough, but I don't feel like we have decided on these things. Um, um, and maybe I mis misunderstood the task force chair, but um, I think we have, Told, saying that we've bought a gondola and now it's just Disneyland at the top of Eagle Crest is also not how it's going to go. Um, hopefully it doesn't in my mind. I think that's a conversation to go as well. And I know that was when I was Mr. on the board. Could you talk about the motion, Mr. Smith? Well, there were just some statements made. Anyway, um, it is about the motion. I guess I'm, I'm going to object. Um, I like this project and I appreciate the ingenuity and I like the location. Um, I like a lot of things about it, actually. I just feel like we are not doing the work that we have told the community we're going to do and have the conversations on. Do we, it, does dispersal mean just last of us fun? I mean, anyway, does it just mean everywhere or does it mean we are going to, are we going to have a discussion on there's places that we just, we don't want it. And I don't think we've had that discussion. Um, I don't know what makes us have that discussion. I know it's a time thing, I, but I hope it has it. Um, and I'm just going to object to moving this forward because it, it's unfortunate. It's, it's, it's just one of the areas that is free of commercial tourism. And at this time, I want to, I would like to either preserve it or just be it noted that I feel like we need to have that discussion um, before we just say yes to everything. So anyway. Thank, thank you, Mr. Smith. Any other comments about the motion? Um, Ms. Hughes-Candies. Thanks, Madam Chair. I um, I think I, in the time that we, I could have been ready to vote on this when we had it in front of us the other night, we sent it to committee and it was a really, it's a really hard decision. I mean, that's the thing we say, it's really fraught. It's a really good project. Uh, on the other hand, we're hearing from members of the community who are saying, we really don't want this here. And that is kind of the, the fun that we all sign up for. Um, the, I feel like we rarely have decisions that are easy to make. 
in that time, however, I did a little digging and I appreciate what staff brought to us. And I do think the clarity between, uh, is it a trail or is it a road? If someone gave me a bag of money to turn it into a real road, I'd go out there myself and <laughs> sweep everybody dog walkers and skiers off it because I definitely understand that it is meant to be, uh, I think Mr. Blydorn called it economic uh, development corridor. So I do have that in the forefront of my mind. For me, it's just that this particular economic opportunity is a victim of timing and it's a victim, and I say a victim of timing, it's because right now we have explosive growth. Um, we just approved the gondola. These things do tie into my decision. These are both out North Douglas. We are, we did the visitor industry task force. Yes. And there's yet more to do. There is the, um, uh, will we have another dock or not? All of these things are connected. Um, and I think it would be foolishness to say that they are not. Um, so I, I appreciate seeing how it was analyzed against our various plans. It does conform with our plans, but that does not mean that necessarily it should be approved. That is the hard work that we have to do because we are not, it would be really easy if we, the staff can in some instances say it conforms with our plan. So it automatically gets approved, but we do not have that luxury. So I, I agree. I, I think it's a great project. I think at this time, however, it's not the right time. So I'm going to be a no to moving this forward. Anyone, uh, Mr. Brisson, you're going to second. I'll give you a chance. But anybody else that hasn't spoken want to speak? Okay, Mr. Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is the most visible uh, business decision that this assembly has had the privilege of being able to make in some time. Uh, the first uh, new tourism venture that is to come before us um, following the pandemic. Um, saying no to this, which even under the people who object, find a lot of valuable merits of this particular business venture. So we have a sustainable uh, business venture that complies with a whole bunch of our uh, the rules that we've already set in place. If we say no to this, we are not just saying no to this group and their venture. We are sending the message that if you try to do anything outside the box, we are going to tell you no because we're afraid of the growth of tourism. These are small tour operations. This is not somebody bringing in 20 buses with serving thousands of people a day. This is a small group tour, very ideal business ownership for the model that Juno offers here. Uh, thank you much for the time, Madam Mayor. Madam Deputy. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Um, everybody, I'll I'll just speak briefly. Um, I agree with a lot of what everybody said, actually, even opposing things, which is why, like Ms. Hughes Candy says, it's not easy. Um, but but in the end, uh, I think one year is uh, appropriate. Um, it, it is a it's a road. It's not a trail. Um, one year, give it a go Two local people trying to do a small number of tours. However, I, I, I also am frustrated that we have not um, set more policies for ourselves. So we know where, I mean, the only thing we have is this TBMP and that's not even us. Um, it says drivers agree not to impede traffic, blah, blah. And drivers agree not to use Sandy Beach, Twin Lakes, Cope Park, Eagle Beach, or Auk Bay Recreation Area, including the Auk Bay Access Road, as tour destinations. So that's policy made up by somebody else, really. And so I'm really, really, uh, in the next year before this comes back, uh, we need to have those conversations because you know, if anyway, I just think we need to have them. It's not fair. But right now, it's not fair to say, I just think this is a small tour operator. I think it's it can happen for a year while we we write this instead of TBMP. Um, so that's another planning process for staff to do. Anyway, um, anybody else want to speak? All right, we'll uh, call for the question.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. This is Mayor Weldon's motion to direct the city manager to negotiate with iRide Alaska and to bring back an ordinance for introduction to the assembly authorizing the use of the property for a one year period. Mayor Weldon. Yes. Walla Hidak. Yes. Ms. Wall. Yes. Ms. Treem. Yes. Mr. Smith? No. Ms. Hughes Scandies? No. Ms. Hale? Yes. Mr. Bryson? Yes. And Deputy Mayor Gladyshevsky? Yes. Motion carries seven to two. I learned how to count. Good, good, good job, Madam. Good, Madam. Good job, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, see the ordinance after you write it. Um, thank you. Um, okay, last item. Uh, loans, affordable housing fund loans. Uh, Mr. Watt. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, we may have saved the hardest topic for last. I'm not kidding. So we'll have a, a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll call the committee meeting back to order. No oh, apologies to the people online for not telling you how long we were going to take. I now see I didn't do that. <clears throat> that would have been um, really nice. Sorry. Um, so we are going to now listen to the city manager talk about loans regarding the affordable housing fund. Mr. City Manager, you're on. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, loans are one of the hardest things that we do. Uh, and we, when we do loans with the affordable housing fund, we are entering into territory um, that is beyond what banks are willing to do. So it's, it's very tricky, uh, very difficult. Um, I am going to try and walk through our history, uh, consequences of the ordinance that you have in front of you, uh, make a recommendation that hopefully we can move forward on. Uh, the first time uh, we did a loan uh, effectively was with the senior housing project. Uh, when we sold the land, at uh, reduced interest rates. Um, it was effectively our first housing loan. Uh, it took a very long time to come to terms on that to figure out how um, we would guarantee payment, not get in the middle of banking, um, not, not have our interest uh, drop so far down the uh, rank of priority that we effectively had no collateral. Our second loan, I think we are very recently completed Gasno Lodge. Uh, uh, apartments, um, very complicated. Again, uh, the property owner suggested a piece of property as collateral. Um, took us over a year to get that to the point where it worked for the developer, uh, worked for the ordinance that we were able to pass. Before you tonight, you have the Ridgeview or the Rooftop Properties LLC uh, project. It's a project that went through the Planning Commission. Um, great project, uh, potential for a lot of housing in Juneau. Along the way, the developer, Mr. Johnson, who's who's been very helpful providing information to staff and been a very good applicant and very good uh, cooperator, uh, applied for a loan of 1.2 million from the Affordable Housing Fund. His project scored very highly. Um, and in the details of negotiating that loan, we've sort of uncovered the root economic issue. Um, we have put out in our information that we would like um, units in the affordable range. Um, when, when Mr. Johnson looked at that and had a back and forth with the staff, he um, proposed a variety of methods, um, but they're all long-term um, for loan, and they get us a very small number of units of affordable housing. So from his perspective, and I understand his perspective, uh, the economics um, of a long-term loan, a 25-year loan, it's only going to get us five 
uh, units at affordable um, prices. Um, that is a long time to tie up 1.2 million um, for that many units. Just in your thought process, um, it's no stretch of the imagination for me to believe that we might need, say, 200 affordable units. And if we followed this method, we would be tying up 40 million uh, for 25 years. Um, I don't think we have that kind of money as much as we want those affordable units. I want to work you through a thought process on money and time value of money. Um, and I'm going to use the the perennial debate about the permanent fund. Um, so the perennial debate about the permanent fund is about the percent of market value, and they generally land on 5% sustainable yield. So if you think about this million that we would uh, loan to Mr. Johnson, um, and you think about 5% of that value a year, that's $50,000. And those five units, that's $10,000 a unit or around eight, 900 a month. That's the delta in the affordability, uh, affordable and market. That's how much it costs either in that long-term capital that's invested in a loan. So a million dollars in perpetuity gets you those five units or 50,000 annually is the subsidy cost for those those units. Neither of those probably are super appealing because again, um, if those 200 units are something that we want, it would require either tying up 40 million or an annual subsidy of 2 million for those units. That is a very complicated agreement to enter into with a private um, developer. So I think, we have learned so much. Um, we're becoming bankers. We're not bankers, but we're we're becoming better bankers. And each time we do a loan, uh, we learn learn more. Um, and each one is unique and problematic and hard. So we're kind of at a fork in the road, where we either um, commit to tying up a lot of money for not a lot of units, or we pivot to something different and the pivot that I think makes sense. And I think we can amend this ordinance and get there and keep this project going. We've talked to Mr. Johnson. He understands the dilemma we're in. We're trying to engage in a three-way conversation with his banker. So the, the pivot is for a private developer, a shorter duration, low interest, zero interest loan that kicks off a market project. And I think that makes sense. And I think the other way we pivot is for affordable units, we start to focus on nonprofits. And the reason that we focus on nonprofits, it's easier as a municipal entity to give money to nonprofits to achieve public purpose. And when we're trying to put public purpose into for-profit private sector, it's just super, super hard. Um, so the philosophy question here, I think, is if the assembly, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you after you've been sitting on the hot seat for a while, is on board with that approach. Um, Mr. Johnson is trying, he has a good project. If you drive by um, the Sunny Point, uh, Lemon Creek area, you can see he's got a, a uh, excavation contractor out there clearing trees, doing work. He wants to move forward. Um, he's got a 24 unit uh, housing development uh, that he'd like to move forward. On this summer, he's trying to work out the banking. There are obviously economic hurdles like every developer we've talked to has talked about. So I think the solution here is um, direct the manager to um, come back with an amended ordinance. It's already been introduced, public hearing on the 20th, the version B with some amendments uh, and a much better follow-up memo, which um, I regret I didn't have for you tonight, um, recommending uh, a template of a short-term, zero interest, probably trending up to some low interest rate uh, for for-profit developers, and then a, a pivot towards uh, trying to move our focus on affordability towards nonprofit entities. I know there's a lot. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions. I think that's as much as I probably can give you right now. So Mr. Watt, if I, just to rephrase what you just said, um, you're you're talking about redrafting this with a slightly different focus, uh, specifically something different for a private developer, a private developer, short term loan. And you would redraft it in that way because it's different than 
Co the nonprofits. Co correct, and it actually would be narrowed. Yep. So it would be it would just be reducing in the existing ordinance the requirement for units in the affordable range. Okay, so that's the um, idea. Um, Ms. Tree, and then Wal Vidak. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I have my hand up. Okay. Uh, and then you're after that. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I I understand the concept. I guess what it's the what it's missing in terms of the economics of all this is that when we add units, even if it's 19 units that are not um, at a specific um, rate, when we add units, we're going to lower the overall cost of housing in Juneau. And I think um, plenty of other communities around the country have seen that <clears throat> increasing the supply of housing lowers the price. So our our aim is on affordability, and one way we do that is through this directed requirement of having a certain number of units be reserved for a certain level of income. But another way we do that is just adding any housing unit to what we currently have. So um, I'm a little, little hesitant at the moment to to restrict ourselves uh, super severely, but I know we're gonna talk about it more. Um, my question though is, we, in this situation or in other situations, I guess we haven't done too many of these yet. So um, maybe just about this one. We're not actually tying up the money for 25 years. They're not making zero payments for 25 years. Is that correct? Or they're Mr. make payments in the interim? Mr. Watt. The, the developer pros proposed 10 years at 0% and then paying off over a 15 year period. Or so, sorry, 10, 10 years of no payments and then a 15 year payoff period. What, what I think the, I think the good model, we found this when we did the senior housing project um, and we worked very hard with that developer and their bank, a local bank. Um, and what we did is we, um, sold them the land and they had no payments for, I think the first five years, which allowed them to get their construction financing and startup capital and everything happening and then paying off the land. And I, I would have to go check the number of years at a low interest rate, which sort of marks, uh, matches our long-term, uh, investment portfolio. And I think that model is better. And I and it's achievable. So in so in the short run, I think we can achieve the terms uh, for a loan for this project that follows our past model. Um, if we kept the affordability in, I do not think we would be able to work out uh, the hierarchy of responsibility between the bank, CBJ, and the developer. M Mr. And Mr. What I thought you said that's what you were going to redraft it as. I'll try that again. Um, I think we can work out uh, a loan uh, without affordability requirements that follows the senior housing land sale model uh, in the short run. But I think if we tried to keep in an affordability requirement, the hierarchy of bank developer and CBJ becomes very complicated. Maybe we can get there in the future, um, but I don't think we can get there in the short run. Okay, well, I'll get back. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just trying to uh, to wrap. It's been a long night. Uh, wrap my mind around what you're saying. So, um, you're proposing um, that that we ask you to redraft this, still at 1.2 million, um, negotiating zero percent interest so that we can move this project forward, but that we're not making the caveat that they have affordable housing within this, this building. And then the second part of your comment was that we don't move forward with for-profit in the future, that we just move to a nonprofit structure for these types of loans in the future. Is that, is that how I understood that? Mr. Watt, so, uh, so explain them all again. First part, yes. Uh, move forward with this loan uh, with a 0% interest and a, a period of time where no payment is required, 
moving towards a 2% loan term yet to be determined uh, for this project, which I think can be a model for uh, for-profit developments. Um, and I think we also uh, direct our attention to the nonprofit sector um, to see if that is an easier path for achieving uh, affordability in units and possibly in private developments. But I think that's a much harder thing to do. It's easier with our nonprofits. Okay, uh, Ms. Hale, then Ms. Sue Scandies. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, I, I think we are learning as we go. And um, I think that what uh, Mr. Manager is describing has been borne out across the country. A lot of communities are finding the same problem, which is that developers can't afford to include uh, affordable housing within their um, within their developments. There's a really excellent uh, Washington Post editorial that reads, the title reads, to revitalize downtowns, cities need to stop making this big mistake. And this big mistake is attaching strings when they're trying to incentivize, um, this is downtowns, but it's incentivizing housing for us. I, I support what Mr. Watt is doing. I think also in other parts of the country, uh, people are finding exactly what Mr. Watt is saying. When you wanna build affording, affordable housing, work with nonprofits, you know, like housing first. So I'm very supportive of this approach. Um, and when it's time for a motion, I'd be happy to make one. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Ms. Uskandis. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, Ms. Hale said some of what I was going to say. It appears to be being borne out nationally that uh, also so other units within a building will subsidize the five that are affordable. Um, so not always the result you desire. I was wondering with the senior project, we did set out a few of those also as well to be affordable. Is that correct? Mr. Watt. I thank you, Chair. So with the senior housing project, we uh, did several things. We sold the land on terms like we've been talking about, but we also gave that project a $2 million grant we gave 1.6 million of general fund and 400,000 of affordable housing fund and the 400,000 of affordable housing fund were to ensure uh, i think what we were calling medicaid beds so lower uh, income um, units so yes we did do that on that project and that we were reviewing the structure of those legal agreements today um, and I, I it was actually interesting how we wove that all together it was hard and good, but because we owned the land and we were providing money um, as a grant, we had two other different legal documents that let us make a nice tapestry. And in this case, we, we don't have that. We don't own the land and we're not giving cash. Okay, um, Ms. Trim. Thank you. Oh, can I have a quick follow-up? Yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. That's that's helpful. Um, when you and also when you say market, are you saying 120 AMI or am I off? Is it higher than that? Mr. Just what? like conceptually, like maybe. Uh, I don't know the answer okay. to the question right now. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Treem. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Deputy Mayor. So that's what we're going to do with Second and Franklin and Gold. Um, I, I just something that I would like to bring back for when we talk about this next time um the the applications we've gotten so far for the affordable housing fund from nonprofits have not been for workforce housing they've been for low-income housing and i don't think we've actually gotten really any for workforce housing which um i don't i don't know how we do that um but when we just talk about this topic again in the future um I don't know, maybe if Mr. Chambor is going to have anything to add on that topic, but uh, if we are restricting something to just nonprofits, I don't know that it's going to get us what we're after. Okay, Ms. Hale. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Watt. It's a quick thing. So, so one of the examples that I've been really interested in lately is Wildflower Court. People formed a community purpose nonprofit for the purpose of providing uh, that care facility. 
and I and and I'm not necessarily suggesting our existing nonprofits are set up for this mission, but I think that's what we um, maybe need to contemplate is facilitating an entity that could do this uh, effort and work. Ms. Hale, you had a motion. Oh, you have a question? Yes, Mad Madam Deputy, Deputy Mayor, I do have a motion. I move. Yeah, go ahead. Ex go ahead. Ex okay. I, I move that we direct the city manager to come back with an amended ordinance uh, uh, serial number 2022-06BAK. And in the amended ordinance, the uh, provision for the fair market workforce housing will be removed um, and other modifications to uh, address that may be required. And I ask for unanimous consent. Okay, Ms. Hale, we're going to go uh, backward to a question. Um, Mr. Smith has a question. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Just so I, there's a cap on how much we can we can provide per unit, right? So for housing fund support, is that right? Mr. Watt. Uh, Deputy Mayor, that. Yes and no. So in the in the solicitation we put out for the affordable fund housing fund applications, we do have some guidelines. Um, the no is the assembly can do anything by ordinance. So when we solicit the proposals, we put we put that out. Um, but that doesn't constrain your ultimate decisions. Right. So I'm just okay. Well, you duck. Yeah, I'm going to object and I'll speak to my objection if that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of, you know, what I see here is the Juno Affordable Housing Fund. And it, while, while I get this is a, a, an interesting circumstance that, that just all the balls rolled into the, this direction that can't be prevented, I really think that as soon as we open this door, every developer in town is gonna to want to get a loan through us because guess what, it's zero interest. Um, and to me, yeah, if they can do it affordably, if they can make affordable housing, then yes. But it's very clear in this proposal that that's not happening. So uh, to me, that is not what the intent of the affordable housing fund is for. Um, so I'm gonna be a no vote on this. Um, other comments, Mr. Bryson, you looked like you were reaching for your Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I, well, I agree with Wahaga Duck uh, because we are benefiting a for-profit. While she is correct, so is Ms. Treem. The more units that we put into the market, the more we're helping the overall problem. Banks are tougher these days. And a banks, uh, for somebody to go through the bank process and become a property owner, with the market conditions that exist, the less we're involved, the higher the cost. So it, it's just the natural things. We got high interest rates, we have high wages, we have high uh, commodities prices. Every step that we take is going to make the housing market a little bit easier in Juneau. 24 housing units, it, while it might not satisfy the low income housing requirement that we're shooting for. We're still not quite sure how to nail that every time. Mr. Watt is correct and going through nonprofits is going to be the only way to actually make uh, homes below market value because it's just expensive. If it costs $300 a square foot to make a new home, there's nothing you can do about that. It costs $300 per square foot to make a new home. We have to decide as the assembly, are we trying to still make that easier? We know that the conditions, banks are tougher. They have higher interest rates, higher requirements. Going through a bank is going to make a project cost more. It's going to be higher in interest rate. It's going to require more capital up front. It's just going to raise the price. If every single person has to go through that perfect bank formula that they want, you have a giant chunk of money. You don't really need to borrow from us. We're going to loan to you. So by going outside the box, we are going to be able to make more things happen. If we want to hold everybody to the same standards as a bank, we're going to run into more issues and we might not move the needle. But if we want to take the easier stuff that the bank's not touching, we want to go outside the box, we, our outcome is going to be more housing units 
because the people that are creating these houses, the people that are, we're, we're starting to get these outside the box ideas. That means that we're trying to use ingenuity to come up with, well, traditional style of going to a bank and saying, I've got X amount of money. I want to build this. It's just not as, uh, it's just not going to create the outcome that we're hoping to as the assembly. So we have to keep our minds open to this if we want the outcome that we're talking about. Because if we stay with the market, we're going to get, end up with a market rate. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a quick question for Mr. Watt. The Gastineau Lodges, what do we do for that? Just very briefly. Um, do you remember? It's complicated. Uh, did we require certain things? We we did so so uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So the Gasno Lodges was a pre-development loan. Um, and it was for a specific purpose in two tranches, um, and it was collateralized by the property right. with the requirement that the uh, funds be invested in the property. Um, kind of a fairly different scenario. Right, but where's the? Did we require some kind of units? We did not. Yeah, I didn't think so either. Okay, that's. I just want to make sure I was correct. Who somebody, Ms. Hughes-Gandys. The Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say I uh, appreciate uh, uh comments and I uh, absolutely am concerned and committed to having affordable units. So I'm, I'm just fine with this moving forward, but I'm definitely going to be digging into it in the meantime. So I just want to put that on the record. Okay, are you guys ready for the question? Okay, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. This is um, Madam Ms. Hale's um, motion to direct the city manager to bring back the amended the um, ordinance 2022-06-BAK with the amendments that he proposed and to remove the workforce housing. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, Ms. Hale. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bryson. Yes. Ms. Hughes Scandies? Yeah. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Treem? Yes. Ms. Wall? <laughs> yes. Well, I'll keep on. No. Mayor Weldon, do we still have you with us? Yes. yes. Okay, we still have you with us. And how do you vote? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just to be clear. And Deputy Mayor Gladys Hess. Yes. Okay. Okay, we all know. Okay. Okay. Anything else to come before the community of the whole? Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention and diligence. We're adjourned. <laughs>